speaker. Member from Aruga Tableland. Good afternoon, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon to members on both sides of the house. It is my pleasure to stand a little early, before I expected, before I predicted, to contribute to this debate on the budget. And it would be remiss of me not to thank, on one hand, the leader of government business, and then my very good friend and colleague from Point Fourteen, for allowing me to jump the queue, so to speak. The reason why I've opted to do that is just to give a, and it's something I never thought I would be doing in my parliamentary career, to respond a little bit to the presentation of the member for Orupooch West. Madam Speaker, I really want to commend the parliament for opting to go with all these plastic bottles and for putting these dispensers outside the chamber, and then for your generosity in suggesting to us but you know, if we feel a little distress or a little frustration that we take a walk, get some water, and come back. So when I saw the member for Urupuch West stand to, you know, contribute, I was motivated to get some water. So I took my glass and I went outside. I'm not sure if it was me or if it was the dispenser malfunctioning. The water flowed so slowly that I couldn't get back in until she had finished. So by the time I came back in, she was sitting down bad timing on my part. Only to be informed by my colleagues that the member had taken a trip to Muruga hunting for hill rice. So apparently the member is a hill rice hunter. I didn't know such a thing existed. And that she had worse than that made some particular aspersions against one of, our, one of my very productive constituents, the member for Orupuch West. And Madam Speaker, you don't test Muruga people. And if you do that, then it is my job to respond on their behalf. Madam Speaker, the member suggested that she went to Muruga and she couldn't find rice anywhere. I mean, the member is a colleague of mine. We might not be on the same side. We might agree on absolutely nothing, but she could have called and I would have given her instructions, look up, because it's literally called hill rice for a reason. It is grown on hills. So if you go around looking at base level for the rice, you're not going to find it. And furthermore, Madam Speaker, I am aggrieved by the fact that a member of parliament stands here and brings the name of a good citizen with a very, very witless pun trying to bring it into dispute. I have a severe problem with that. If the member wants to cast aspersions on anybody anywhere in this country, she has a whole bench with which she can start. <coughs> Madam Speaker, the constituent in question is a very, very hardworking individual. He is a farmer. More than that, he's somebody who has come back to the community after living in urban Trinidad for a long time and has, through his great efforts, helped to revive, helped to strengthen, helped to grow, literally and figuratively, a part of our agricultural display that has been, if not dead, then sort of dormant for a long time. Madam Speaker, this person is not only growing Muruga hill rice, he is processing the hill rice. He is selling this hill rice locally. He is also exporting the rice overseas. Madam Speaker, he has a very viable market for this rice. And this is something I know not just by conjecture, I know intimately because I visited the farm and whereas one could suggest that there are parts of it that require improvement, it is a very interesting setup that he has. Madam Speaker, this gentleman right now is packaging Muruga Hill rice, and he is selling it both locally and internationally. A little pack of rice, a one pong bag about this size, selling it for $50. Madam Speaker, this is an industry that was in abeyance for a very long time. And by his hustling and bustling and, and hard work and, and entrepreneurship, and willingness to take risks. He has helped to revive this so that what was a sort of a hidden or niche production area is now widely popular, not just locally, but internationally. 
for the member to come here and talk about his name and suggest that there is some sort of untoward behavior because he has been granted assistance by the government is sad and distasteful. And I take offense at that. Madam Speaker, if anything should be done by any member of this chamber, if there's anything that we should be doing, we should be encouraging our, our citizens, our constituents, to work hard, to be productive, to be innovative, to do things that earn us for an exchange. We talk about diversification and we talk all around it and all through it. But here we have a member of parliament who is castigating somebody who is actively right now earning foreign exchange for this country. And I take great offense at that. Great offense. And I could go on and on about, about Orupuch West, but Madam Speaker, that would be a colossal waste of time. This member who talks like if every night before she presents, she just suddenly found a dictionary, learned 10 words, and wants to use all of them at the same time in the same sentence. And I could go down that rabbit hole, but I don't really have time for that. So I would just suggest that the member stay in her lane, wherever that lane is, and leave Muruga people alone. Thank you very much. Because we don't bite easy. And I move on. Madam Speaker, this is the fifth budget presentation that I'll be making in this session, and the last. In this session. In this session. In this session. They ain't here in the end session, but in this session. I come back again in the next session, but in this session, this is the last budget speech. And Madam Speaker, just like every member on this side who's gone before me, it would be remiss of me if I did not give kudos where they are well deserved. So I want to congratulate on one hand, the Minister of Finance. On the other hand, the Honorable Prime Minister. And if I could borrow my colleague's hand here right next to me, the Minister of Planning, for putting together what must be hailed as an excellent budget package. And that's very trite and very easy to say. But Madam Speaker, it is really a minor chord and a major theme. You see, there's one thing to talk about a budget as a discrete thing, and to some extent they are, but they're not really, you know. It's really the fifth in a succession of budgets that we've presented since we've been in <laughs> government. And Madam Speaker, it might not be a big deal now, because we are a country that is motivated and captured by what we consider to be very tangible things. We like to see tangible things being done. And we sometimes, in the midst of doing that, don't give enough credit to the things that we might discern as being intangible, but are, in fact, tremendously important. Madam Speaker, in the five years of governance that this PNM regime has had, we faced the most difficult time in the lived history of this country. There are people who are living now who are full of those who have never been through a hard time in this country. I am pseudo old. So I was a child in the 80s when we went through this last time. And it was far more difficult than we are facing now. Not because the circumstances are different, but because of the astute way in which this crisis has been managed by this government. And Madam Speaker, there will be naysayers all over the place who will say all sorts of things about it. But if there's one thing that I have learned from my historical training, it is that years down the road, the old talk from the so-called academics, people forget that, you know. The old talk from the political naysayers will be forgotten too. What will stand is the record of what was done, by whom, and when, and the meaning of it, and the significance after. And I, I am very happy and proud to see that this tenure, this management of this economy, by this government will stand the test of time and will be something that everybody in this country, whether you're PNM or not, will be proud of. I am absolutely assured of that. I could go down off on a tangent a bit, Madam Speaker, and talk a little bit, I mean literally a little bit, about the response of the opposition leader to the budget. 
Madam Speaker, I have been for five years sitting here for the excruciating three plus hours of that response, excuse me, excruciating. All of it in caps locks, excruciating. Three plus hours of that habitual response, hoping for one thing, that in one of these five years, I would hear a response that was different from the first one I heard in 2015. This year, it started off a little different. I was saying, okay, maybe a new spirit writer, maybe something different. Maybe we'll hear at least a few sentences that deviate from the one we heard before that and before that, like a bad, a bad Benjai Calypso. Instead, what I heard was the same thing. This government is doing nothing. My government did everything. We are an excellent government. We solved every problem. And Trinidad is perfect underneath us. And, and since we've been voted out, everything has gone to hell. Madam Speaker, that's very fine as a narrative. But there is one fundamental problem with that. Now, unless I am confused or mistaken, we have not had a population exchange in this country. Some people have died. Some people have been born. We had some Venezuelan migrants coming in. Some people might have migrated. But in majority, the 1.3 or 1.4 million people who were living here now post 2015 with the same people who were living here before 2015. So I am not sure who that narrative is supposed to sell to, Madam Speaker, because I, who now a member of parliament for a very proud constituency, was a citizen here during the period 2010 to 2015, meaning that I lived in this country under that UNC government. And all of that hard work and all of that production and all of that productivity was perhaps happening, happening on the end. It wasn't happening in Trinidad or Tobago. Madam Speaker, one of the members across there referred to them as, quote unquote, the box during government, that that was an aspersion thrown at them, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, referring to the PP government as a box during government is aspirational. That suggests that they either built or finished a box drain, which I am not certain about at all, having lived in this country during that same period. Madam Speaker, and I'll add one more thing to that and I'll move on. And it is this. Every government in this country, in the history of this nation, that has lost an election, at some point, either tacitly or indirectly, understood that the nation rejected them for some reason. Might have been something that they were displeased about, something they expected, something they wanted that the government did not receive. So it is a rejection. If you lose an election, it is to some extent a rejection. And that rejection must be based on something. And every other party, either PNM, the old UNC, because I heard about something called a new UNC, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe that's an incarnation to come, so the comedy will continue. But every other government, either PNM or all UN, oh sorry, all, all UNC or NAR, understood that the nation had rejected them for a reason and accepted that there was some error or some fault or some failing or some inadequacy and then made the transformations required and came again. Either the nation would accept you or they would not but you accepted that your tenure was not perfect, there was some dissatisfaction or some displeasure within or throughout the society, and you went and you come again. When the PNM lost in 2010, that's what happened. The party accepted that the population was displeased with it for specific reasons, that some of those reasons were actionable, and the party made some transformations and we came back like a storm in 2015, man and speaker. This UNC government, either old UNC or new UNC, whichever one they think they are, is the only party in the history of this nation to lose an election, to not have that soul searching, to not have that introspection, to not have that basic decency as a political organization, to say, you know what? Maybe we made some errors. Maybe we went wrong. Maybe our philosophy was off. Maybe some of our personnel, we could really you know, recycle and come again with new people. Maybe there were errors in our tenure that we should address and we should admit to. 
and then we come again and we ask for a mandate. This is the only party in the history of this country that has so much cocoa in the sun, the sun is almost fighting to shine and has never, ever admitted error, never, ever apologized, not made any kind of fundamental transformation, not made any effort to show the country a different face, but coming back and trying to convince us that wrong is right and right is wrong. And all the things we saw and experienced was our imagination, and they were perfect. And we should give them a chance again. Madam Speaker, that is the height of political disingenuous behavior. And I am fairly certain that the public, that they feel they're fooling with that rhetoric, is not asleep. That that public is noting, and that public will give them the response they deserve one year from now, and I will live to see it. Madam Speaker. And I'm done with that. Because you know what, Madam Speaker? I am not here on my time. If I were here on my time, I could spend the whole day knocking those opposite. But I am here on the people's time. I didn't elect me and put me here. The constituents of Muruga Table Land put me here. So I am on the <laughs> clock for them. So I have to give an account of what I have been doing on their behalf for the last year. Because that is the priority for me. I have a partner in the ministry. You go talk about the ministry business, I see what. If I have enough time this afternoon, I will talk a little thing about what, from my perspective, we've been doing. But my primary function is to account for my service to the people for the last year. And if I could be so bold, Madam Speaker, let me lend another suggestion to them. They could do that. You're not only an MP when you're in government, you know. I am sure they have constituents. It's not zombies vote for them. And instead of coming here and talking nonsense for 55 minutes, just rambling on foolishness, you could stand and say, even though I'm in opposition, I have been working for my people and what I do. In five years, I never hear that. So they have no constituents. They have no constituency. You are only an MP when you're in government. But as far as I know, when people vote for you, Regardless of where you sit, they expect that you represent them and you serve them, and you could serve people in opposition too. Maybe the lesson has been lost on those opposite. But I will account for what I've been doing for my people in my constituency, and all of them, whether they vote for me or not, they're my people. All 28,000 of them, and their families too. I will account for what I've been doing to make their lives better for the last year. And not me alone, because I'm not an actor by myself, what the government that I am a part of has been doing for them for the last year. And Madam Speaker, normally I will talk the big ticket issues. Because in my constituency, when you're talking big ticket, it's still roads and water. But I will go off script this year, because I want to sing the same every year. That's one. And then two, I have been, I have been motivated by the member for Separia. <laughs> so instead of talking roads, or talking water, I'll start by talking about housing. Because just like I was shocked, Madam Speaker, to hear that the member for Oropooch West was in Moruga hunting for rice, I was surprised to hear that the member for Separia was in my constituency. Actually, he didn't even call and say hello. <laughs> if I go to Separia, I will call and say hello. We ain't had to be enemies if we know you're on the same side, on different sides. We don't have to be enemies, Madam Speaker. She didn't even say hello. And that's interesting, Madam Speaker. Because there have been seven prime ministers of this country. Dr. Rowley is the seventh prime minister of this country. And the member for Separia is the only prime minister in the history of this country that never came to Muruga. So while she was in the position of prime minister, she never came to Muruga. Opposition leader, she shows up in Muruga. Why? Why would you ask? Is she coming to do something useful, something purposeful? Of course not. The ethos of that party is Bacchanalia and Lages. So they're on that side, so they're not Lages. So it had to be Bacchanalia. Of course, it was Bacchanal. And then you would hear our Madam Speaker in her presentation talk about a community in my constituency, Gomez Trace, and some HDC housing, and that she is heroically going to come to the rescue of my constituents. Well, thanks. It's have one MP there. I am more than adept at doing my job, and it is my job to help my constituents. We don't need or want your help. Thank yeah. you very much, Member for Separia. 
poor as usual, serving no useful purpose. But I move on. Madam Speaker, the AGC in its infinite wisdom decided to build a second scheme of a housing scheme in my constituency at a place called Gomez Trace in St. Mary's. Madam Speaker, it is a lovely development. I have my own peculiar concerns about living in one of these HGC complexes, how you make out the houses look the same, and I could go on. But when I tell you, Madam Speaker, the place is beautiful, very beautiful. In fact, the Prime Minister, when he came to distribute the, house, the houses, commented on how picturesque that community is. The same member would have said in this house that the, the government has not built one house since it came into office. Well, I was very happy that the agency didn't build not one, they, just built, they built 71. So we had 71 houses to distribute. And Madam Speaker, we gave those houses, or we tried to give those houses, via the HGC to those people who, are, who were most in need. And the process went very well. Madam Speaker, like in any construction, if you're mass producing something, you build 71 houses, you're going to have some annoying issues. You're going to have some niggling issues. I met with the residents of Gomez Trace, second phase, had a discussion. There are some concerns. I took the concerns to HGC. HGC sent people to check. They're going to fix the concerns. They were not fixed overnight. These things happen. Everything takes time. There's always a process. And then the issue with the price, which I also took to the minister, which he took to the board, and there was an investigation being done. In the midst of that, prompted by one or two persons in the community, the, the leader of the opposition decided to get involved as a champion for nothing or no one just to make back an eye. Madam Speaker, I was amused and bemused. The constituents were nonplussed. And the whole thing just became a bacchanal. I am happy to report today that with my colleague, the member for, for um, Point 14, we have already started to address the substantive structural issues that will be getting soon. We've already had a decision from the board that the pricing issue is going to be adjusted already. So the member for Separia, Madam Speaker, threatening that our pre-action protocol letter we're going to be sent to the AGC is to scare whom? I really don't know. We are already solving the problem on one hand, that's one. And two, we ain't afraid no letter from the learned senior counsel. Sure. Madam Speaker, the Attorney General eats that kind of thing for lunch or if he's bored for breakfast. That's one. And if I might be so bold, I could even go a little further. Madam Speaker, I have always said that if by some fate, twist of fate, I end up in court in some kind of case, I go represent myself because I could think logically and speak coherently. And I'm sure, Madam Speaker, if, they, if the government wants to try it out, they could send me because if the senior counsel is on the other side, I'm going to win. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the problem that never existed in a fundamental way because when you have problems, Madam Speaker, you work with people to solve them. Not everything always had to be a bacchanal. You work with people to solve them, and we were working with the AGC and the residents to solve them, and we solved the problem. So, Madam Speaker, the member for Separius is um, free to send a letter, you know, but nobody can take it on. We don't deal with the issues, and we will make the residents comfortable and happy, and life will progress as it always does. And that's how this thing goes. So that's one part of the housing issue I want to discuss, Madam Speaker. Other part is something of which I am tremendously proud. The Ministry of Housing is, very, is tremendously proud. The ministers of housing who have been part of parcel of this are tremendously, proud, are tremendously proud. And that is something called the HVIP program. Madam Speaker, I started explaining this thing last year and it didn't really go as I wanted to because of expedience. So I'll give a proper explanation this year. Madam Speaker, while we were campaigning in 2015, Prime Minister walked with me and other members through a particular community called Samuel Cooper. And Madam Speaker, when the Prime Minister saw the quality of housing in that community, he was startled, he was shocked, and he was moved to act. 
In fact, he gave me an instruction, which was that when he came back there in 2020, he did not expect to see any of the houses of that nature that he saw on that day. And Madam Speaker, I was new to politics. I didn't know, I mean, politicians say things. I'm not sure how much they remember in the, in the plethora of things that they will see because he walked the entire country. Madam Speaker, within the first year or two years of our tenure, the Prime Minister gave then Housing Minister um, Randall Mitchell and myself an instruction that he had not forgotten about those houses and that he was adamant that something should be done. And that between the both of us, we should put heads together and come up with a solution. And I really want to give credit to my colleague and friend Randall Mitchell because he did the brain work, which is to conjure up this thing literally out of nothing. You have poor housing in a community, and other ancillary problems, and maybe you could solve a number of problems at the same time. So we didn't know what to do. Give people a grant. We're not sure how they're going to spend it. Should we hire contractors? We're not sure how the costing will be. And after going back and forth between the both of us, came up with a scheme that we would literally have people who had access to land on which there were no encumbrances, and we would basically hire local contractors to build, excuse me, what we might call starter units, but what were really much better than starter units. And we would do that in a way that kept the cost literally minimal, and we would see how it would work. So between Randall, I'm sorry, my colleague, um, <laughs> member for San Fernando East, yeah, see, friendship is a funny thing, who sort of came up with the framework and then he gave it to me to run with and to implement. And Madam Speaker, we had a very small sum, $5 million. And we had a grandiose plan, which was to build 30 houses, a community center, and a number of drains to sort of ensure that the houses would not be threatened by the always slipping land in the constituency. And Madam Speaker, honestly, I really had no idea how this thing would go. Literally, I had no idea how it would go. So that when the project started, I was on the ground in that community myself. If not every day, almost every other day, because the expectations were so high, the funding was so small that if you literally made a mistake on a house, it meant that a family would not have a house. It took some time because when you're doing something for the first time, it is sometimes walking in the dark. Madam Speaker, at the end of that, at a cost of less than $5 million. We literally built 30 homes for 30 families, Madam Speaker. Families who, because of the poverty, and there is no shame in that, because of the poverty that they faced, would not be able to qualify for an HTC house on one hand, and would not be able to provide for themselves the kind of housing that we believe in the government that every citizen in this country should be privy to, we provided for them 30 houses in one community. Yeah. And Madam Speaker, by doing that, we've sort of changed the historical trajectory of that particular community. And I'm even happier to suggest that this thing has not stopped there. Madam Speaker, that was the first phase of that project. We distributed those houses in earlier this year. Subsequent to that, with the assistance of my good friend and colleague, the member for Point 14, Minister of Housing, we had a second phase of that project where we built, throughout the entire constituency, 20 houses. Even better than that, we are actually on the third phase where we are attempting to build right now, as I speak here, as I blow air here, people are at work in the constituency building 20 houses. Madam Speaker, that means that by the end of this year, this government, not me, this government, would have provided 70 houses. 70 houses, Madam Speaker, to families that had little hope of providing proper housing to themselves. <laughs> Madam Speaker, this project has been so successful for the last year that it has infected other constituencies out of Maruga. <laughs> I have colleagues here who are also benefiting from this. So that a Maruga experiment 
is in, in a very interesting way becoming a national experiment. And Madam Speaker, we are providing homes to families that are in need, that cannot afford, of a quality that they could move in literally the next day and live. And Madam Speaker, your standard of living and by that your life changes literally overnight at a reasonable cost with local contracting, with local labor. Madam Speaker, if nothing else is accomplished by this government, if nothing else is accomplished by any government, <coughs> providing this kind of avenue to our citizens is a tremendously good and rewarding thing. <laughs> Madam Speaker, there's a community that I visited in 2015 where the people live on state land, but it's surrounded by private land. Madam Speaker, there are people in this country who are still living in the 19th century. They have no running water. They have no electricity. Madam Speaker, I told myself when I campaigned there and I saw those families that if I didn't do something to help them, I should not be even entertaining going back as a member of parliament. Madam Speaker, the private landowners have refused the state to run water or lights through their land to get these people. So they are literally on an, on a, they are literally on an island. Madam Speaker, they are still lose, using lagoon water to cook, to bathe, to wash. And whereas I might have to get the Attorney General's help to actually get the lights, get the water to them. Madam Speaker, these people live in home homes. Many of them have no floors. And if you know anything about country living, there's a traditional kind of floor we call lipe, where the floor is prepared and it's like, almost like cement. It's not even that. They are literally living on the dirt of the ground, Madam Speaker. And if I can't do anything in the immediate to help them in terms of getting that water, getting those lights, the least we could do, Madam Speaker, is to get them some proper housing and we work on the rest after. And I've already spoken to my colleague and we've already agreed and we'll be taking that project down there to help those families in the next year. And Madam Speaker, I'll be very frank. They are not supporters of this party. We might get a vote out of it. But you know what? That don't matter. These are human beings. And if I meet them in that condition, and I leave them in that condition, as an MP who is from the constituency and lives in the constituency, then I am worse than anybody who would have come before and come after. I cannot do that. So, Madam Speaker, we always talk in this country about government and governance not helping the small man, not changing lives, not affecting the lives of the common people, quote unquote. That's a term I really hate to hear. But this government, not just through those programs, but this is one that shines very bright. This government has been changing the lives of families in ways that are irrevocable. And Madam Speaker, you really have to see what it means to these families. Your heart could be as hard as stone, it will touch you. And that process is not ongoing only in my constituency, sorry, the constituency I represent. It is ongoing in a number of constituencies. And I could see it spreading nationwide and changing the lives of our citizens everywhere. And that is a fantastic thing. Right, so enough talk on housing. So I'll move on to my favorite topic, which is the Muruga Road. Madam Speaker, when the survey of the road started, because it's part of the PNS manifesto, that we would, we would do what has not been done before, which is to have a proper road that goes from Princess Town to Moruga. Madam Speaker, when the first survey of that road was done, and they checked the number of major landslips. I don't mean minor hindrances, I mean major landslips. The number was 29. 29 major landslips. Madam Speaker, when that project started, the two years subsequent, given the, on one hand, 
the amount I rain for we had in the constituency. And then on the other hand, the, the type of soil which doesn't aggregate all that well and which needs no excuse to slip. Madam Speaker, I feel sometimes if you walk and you sneeze too hard, you cause a landslip. The, the soil is that fragile. The number raised from 29 to 45. So it has a significant jump in the amount of wood that had to be done. And Madam Speaker, if you don't fix those landslips, doing any kind of road work is really a cosmetic thing. This government decided that they were going to do something fundamental and unprecedented to have a decent road that traverses this constituency. Madam Speaker, I am very, very happy and very pleased to report that of those 45 landslips, 39 have already been completed. Madam Speaker, this has been a Herculean task. Madam Speaker, there are constituents who are thankful for this work, but themselves do not believe that this road can be fixed in totality, given the fact that they've lived with it all their lives, and given the fact that they understand, because they live there, the magnitude of the job at hand. Madam Speaker, there are major landslips in Fifth Company, close to the Fifth Company Baptist School. There is one at Perry Young. There are two as you enter Bastia. There's probably one other in Bourgeoisier, and we intend to fix those. The Ministry of Works intends to fix those this year. And doing that, they would have done something that has never been done before, which is to fix every landslip along the Muruga. And when that is finished, Madam Speaker, they will complete the road surface. Significant parts of it have already been done. That part that covers St. Mary's has already been paved. Much of Muruga has already been paved. Much of Indian work is still a disaster zone. But even that, <coughs> there's remedial work being done. So Madam Speaker, the constituents of Muruga Tableland, many of whom live along that road or traverse that road every day, have suffered for a very long time. because of the quality of that road. Yeah. But they are seeing the light of day. And Madam Speaker, I really want to commend the Prime Minister. And this is not no mama guy, this is not mama guy or papi show, any of that. Madam Speaker, I was very, very comfortable in UE having a ball Talking nonsense, but calling it lecturing. Yes, I'm still having a ball. <laughs> talking nonsense, but calling it lecturing. And I would not have left what was a very comfortable life and job to come into something that I knew little about, that I had great skepticism about. If I had not heard then opposition leader and prime minister to be talk about rural development in a way that I had never heard a politician address it before. The way he explained it, the way he dissected it, the fact that he understood the meaning of these things. Mm -hmm. Because that road, Madam Speaker, is not a road. It has a tremendous symbolic meaning for the people of that constituency. Its significance is outsized. It's not just infrastructure. It's a cultural phenomenon. Having a bad road is as maruga as the rice that grows on the hill. For the first time because we have a Prime Minister who understands what these things mean, we are approaching a time where we have a proper road that the entire constituency could be proud of. And that is a tremendous thing. And take it from somebody who lives there and traverses that road every day. And Madam Speaker, that's a tremendous project. It's sizable. It's very expensive. But far more than that, in the midst of that tremendous project, the Ministry of Works is also doing a similar job on the Naparima Mayara Road. Yeah. It might not be as in-depth, and a member from Mayara could attest to that, that they are doing also an upgrade on Naparima Mayara Road. <laughs> Country people are important member for the yeah. Martin Northeast. Yeah. It will come. So while, we're doing, while the Ministry of Works is doing that tremendous job in Muruga, they are also improving, Madam Speaker, the road infrastructure along the other main artery through the constituency, which is the Napa Mami Road. Added to that, Madam Speaker, 
Because I am faced with a wonderful organization, excuse me, called the Pakistan Regional Corporation, which has a very peculiar way of allocating its funding, where areas, quote unquote, deemed PNM get very, very little assistance. I have had the good fortune to have other colleagues in this government who step in to help me in other areas. So for example, you can't get a council to pave a road in an area depending on the perceived political allegiance. I have been very good at getting the help of the Minister of Rural Development, and he steps in to help with road um, repair, sometimes road paving in other areas where the Ministry of Works is not allowed to extend its reach. So whereas, Madam Speaker, I'll be very frank and very truthful and say that many of the roads in the constituency remain bad. There is a tremendous amount of work still to be done. But the improvements in the constituency in terms of road infrastructure and have reached a point that people in that constituency have never seen in their entire lives. And I would, I would be so bold to suggest that regardless of their political allegiances, they will be very thankful for the work that's been done by this government because government serves everybody not just the people who vote for it. And I, as a constituent, I am also thankful for this government for doing the kind of work that they've been doing in that constituency in terms of roads. Madam Speaker, the other big issue in terms of the constituency and the need for infrastructure is, of course, water. And water is a hot button issue throughout the entire country. Madam Speaker, the problem is, and the problem has been, that there are a number of communities that simply have no access to pipe-borne water because there are no lines in the ground. What we've been doing since 2015 is trying to address that situation by running the lines. So I am happy to report that a number of communities, I talked about Marak last year, we've gone to six companies um, in the last, this last year, we've gone to Hindustan, we're also starting to make incursions into Tableland because, Madam Speaker, despite all of the spin of former era, there are a number of areas in that constituency that literally don't have pipes in the ground. They either have to live on the water, the water from heaven, or hope for a truck borne supply. This government, under the astute leadership of the Minister of Public Utilities, has been doing the hard work of laying those pipes so that we have two large projects, one in Tableland, um, in Khorasan, one in Millennium City and Manticou that are, that are upcoming, and we will really try our best to make sure, Madam Speaker, that every single constituent will have access to pipe-borne water in the really, really, really not too distant future. And that project is well underway. We've already collected much of the material for that major project in Tableland, and we're just waiting for this process to end there, get the funding, and the beat goes on. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'll be very frank. As a person who's lived in the country, I was born in the city. My mother came to her senses after three months and carried me back to the bush, and I grew up there. <laughs> and for people in the country, water and roads are our central concerns. We might care about everything else, but you give us water and roads, we're relatively comfortable. This government is doing what has not been done for 50 years, which is giving the people water and roads. And whereas they may have other concerns peculiar to them, and they might be happy about everything, they're relatively comfortable. Take it from the MP. I'll talk to them every day. The project goes on. Madam Speaker, we also have one or two very interesting projects that augur well for the future of this, not just the constituency, but the nation. There is a youth complex being built at Fifth Company in Muruga. That is, in my mind, very important. When I speak in my former life, before I was lecturing in UA, I used to be a youth coach. I coached football, cricket, netball, believe it or not, um, athletics at the junior level. I've trained a few national champions in my time, and I was actually good at it, and then, well, something went wrong and I ended up here, but that's not the point. What I can say, <laughs> Madam Speaker, is that not just in Muruga, not just in Tableland, not just in Barakpur, not just in my constituency, but all through this country, 
as someone who was very good at assessing talent, because that's a skill. Assessing talent, particularly at the youth level, is a skill. You either could do it or you can't. I mean, you could be taught it, but it's a specific skill. That's why there are people who are paid to do that. Madam Speaker, you could come to my constituency. You could visit Barakpur, you could visit Tableland, you could come to Muruga, go to Six Company, go to Marak, wherever you want to go. Madam Speaker, I think that's a sign. Speaking time is now spent. You can take the 10 more minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You may proceed. Madam Speaker, you could come and drive around for the to the community, not looking for rice, but you know, observing people. <laughs> and you will see young people, Madam Speaker, with tremendous physical attributes, tremendous ability, just gaping around, walking up and down. Madam Speaker, you will, see, you will see people with the proper coaching. Could be a world-class high jumper, world-class long jumper, world-class shot put, put out of the shot, world-class discus. You go to Barakpo, endless cricketers. <coughs> you come to Muruga with the sixth company, you go to Tableland, football. World-class talent, just wasting time. Part of that is a lack of infrastructure in the soft sense, in terms of club structures, grassroots coaches, or, or people just interested enough to try to guide them. And there are people who do that. I have a friend at um, Mandingo Road, has a very good youth program going at football. I support him every year. Has a lot of youth involved in football. He's now involved in cricket, and it's working very well. But there are a number of communities that don't have that soft infrastructure, don't have that organization. And then you have all these young people just what might be, I mean literally world-class talent, just going nowhere. The other side of the problem is a lack of facilities. If you drive from Marak to Princess Town, when you reach at St. Mary's, there's an underdeveloped field there. And when you leave St. Mary's, which is like half the road, all the way to Princess Town, Madam Speaker, there is not a ground anywhere. And when I say a ground, not a savannah, nothing. Nothing, no infrastructure. No, part of that is geography because the land is very undulating. So getting a piece of flat land large enough is, I mean, like a bridge too far. But it's still a lack. And you have people who need to be served. Honest speaker, this government is building what I will deem a world class. It's called a multi-purpose complex, but it's really a sporting complex in Moruga that will provide the facility that is missing to start to shape and hone all of this natural talent. <laughs> Madam Speaker, my constituency has been producing national cricketers out of Barakpur, footballers out of Maruga, out of six companies, out of the companies, with almost no infrastructure in place. And, I, and by that I mean soft or literally physical infrastructure. Imagine what is possible if you provide the infrastructure to the talent and then we find some way to get that coaching. And I've been working with the Minister of Sport in terms of doing this, to get that coaching at the grassroots level. And if you know anything about sport, Madam Speaker, we always think it's a big name coach, the, high, the celebrated coach who does the work. But any fundamental research on sport development says that it's the grassroots coaches who do the work. Right now, the area around France, around Paris and France, is producing the world's best footballers. Think about any famous name in terms of world football here, who is French, and most of the best footballers right now are French, not Brazilian anymore. Most of the best footballers in the world are French. They come from one area around Paris. And that is happening because, not because of the big clubs, or because of famous coaches, because they have a very effective grassroots coaching program. That's where Pogba and all these guys come from. They sort of have a, a, a nucleus of coaching ability at the grassroots level. So they find them very young, six, seven, eight, and they start coaching them. And they are churning out world-class footballers like it's bread. Madam Speaker, we have areas of this country where that kind of thing, turning out, not churning out, churning is ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's because there are areas of this country where that sort of thing is possible. 
And Maruga Tableland is one of those. So don't be surprised. Right? I'm not sure what the cost is. The Minister of Sports is not here to help me. But whatever the cost is, 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 is reasonable. If we build one sporting complex, which in a very concrete way, but also symbolically, helps us to take this talent that is just walking around and start shaping it into what it can be. That's very good for the community. It's very good for the young people themselves. But it's also very good for the nation. We have to stop in this country thinking of sport as though it's a hobby, a fun thing. Sport is a business. It's a multi-trillion dollar business worldwide. And we have the kind of talent to tap into it. But we treat it as an also ran to some extent. We don't see it as a fundamental thing. Even though we say it, culturally it isn't. But sport here could be a major part of our economy. So part of that is reconceptualizing how we see it. And complexes like these will not accomplish it as of themselves, but they will play a fundamental part in doing that kind of thing. And the last thing I want to talk about very quickly is this agro-processing plant. Madam Speaker, the Minister of Agriculture already gave the screed on the importance of agriculture. I will not retread the wheel. What I will say is that for this economy to really fundamentally diversify, we have to start to open up dormant areas of our nation. I mean those that have been dormant geographically, those that have been forgotten, undertapped, underutilized. We have to start waking these sleeping giants. Madam Speaker, we've survived very long and reasonably well by focusing on a few areas. But our economy has always been a very cul-de-sac economy. It is a dead end. Just a matter of when you reach the end of the road, but we know, the, we know there's an end there. Unless we get more areas of our country actively involved in economic production, we're really going to have a very difficult future. So if it is the government or the state invests some money in an agro-processing plant in Moruga, and because of that, we spur a kind of agricultural renaissance in the community, that doesn't just benefit the constituency. It doesn't just benefit the pineapple farmers of Tableland or the rice producers of Maruga or the fishermen of Maruga. It benefits the entire country. Because the more productive areas we have in the country benefits the country. The more economic activity we have in the country benefits the country. So that Maruga aggressive processing plant is not a conceit. It's really meant to be a part of our diversification trust or as someone said, transformation trust, it's just semantics. You want to change the thing to make it more diverse, more profitable, and better. And you don't do that unless you get more areas in the country productive. We have acres of land just lying there doing nothing. That would have been plantations or, or, or small holdings productive years ago. They're just doing nothing now unless we get them productive again, and not just Maruga Table and all over unless we as a nation become far more productive, and I mean productive in terms of output, but also in terms of productivity. We'll just keep talking about diversification and wasting time, Madam Speaker. And at this junction in our history, time is of the essence. We ain't got the time to waste. So now for the grand finale. Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker I spent four plus years at the MP of what I consider to be the best constituents in the country, Oh, look at Vex, that's all your business. That is all your business. <laughs> yeah, that is all your business. It has been an interesting and vivid experience. I have learned a lot. I have tried my best to do what the people expect, which is 50 years a week in five years, which is impossible, given difficult times, but we've tried. We have a leader who understands the importance of rural development and who is supportive, and that has helped. At the end of the day, Madam Speaker, as a government, We've succeeded at a number of things. Nice. Things. It's easy to build stuff. Madam Speaker, you, you, you fix a highway, you build this, you build that. That's easy to do. Some do it, some don't, but it's relatively easy to do. Taking a country that was in many ways shattered, holding things together, trying to get institutions to operate again, trying to stabilize the economy, taking expenditure that was too high to down where our heart could reach, 
trying to raise revenue to almost mirror expenditure. These are things that will not win you prizes or popularity, but they are fundamentally important. If you don't do them, you don't have a country. And Madam Speaker, it has been our pleasure as a government to serve this country and to make sure that we have our country. And where, whether or not we get thank you or kudos or people wave flags, whether those on the other side beat up their mouth and say we ain't do nothing, that is the business, Madam Speaker. <laughs> we came here to serve a nation. We have done that. We have one more year. We'll do it again, and then we'll come back for five years and do it again. Madam Speaker, I thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for recognizing me. Madam Speaker, I want to say, um, after the leader of the opposition's budget reply on Friday to the reply of the budget by the Diego Martin Ortiz, Minister of Finance, you see, Madam Speaker, when, you, when some, I was in my medical office on, on Saturday morning after the leader of the opposition did her speech, and out of 15 people that came, Madam Speaker, nine of them indicated to me that the leader of the opposition's budget presentation was the true budget for Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Madam Speaker, and I want to congratulate the I want to congratulate the leader of the opposition for bringing an emblem of a speech, Madam Speaker, a speech that you see, Madam Speaker, is a speech that showed a futuristic representation of where our country is supposed to go. It dealt with every single aspect of a country's an, an economy, moving it holistically forward. And Madam Speaker, I may have to say that it wasn't just the people who came to the office were not just UNC diehard supporters, because they would support no matter what. But they were, some of the patients, Madam Speaker, were middle of the road people, and believe it or not, some PNM people. And they all said, that was the true budget. You see, Madam Speaker, when you, when, you hear, when you hear something like that, Madam Speaker, you see, you feel a sense of pride. You know, you feel as though, you know, you belong to an organization, Madam Speaker, that is going somewhere. And the Minister of Finance had three hours, Madam Speaker, to, to convince the population what he was doing was right. But he did not convince the member from Maruga Tableland on his budget presentation that the country was going anywhere. You see, listening to the member from Maruga Tableland, I really thought, Madam Speaker, we were in an EBC report that we were still discussing the EBC report. You see, all I heard, all I heard, Madam Speaker, was about Maruga Tableland, what was happening in Maruga Tableland, and one aspect of our country as if the rest of the country didn't exist. So I really believed we were still in the EBC report that we were, well, that we were, um, we were debating the other night at the end of the, of, the, of, the, of the area. You see, Madam Speaker, normally in a debate, <clears throat> it is nice to hear one side of our argument, and when you get up, you have to refute some part of the argument. <clears throat> I have nothing to refute. It's sad. So I wonder how I'll make up my 50 minutes. <laughs> because a person, the member from Moroga Tiburan stood there. The member from Moroga Tiburan stood there. And God, I mean, I, I, was, I was taken back, Madam Speaker. What can I respond to? What is there in this gentleman's substance who is supposed to be a university lecturer? I mean, I wonder if they have lowered the standards in UAE. <laughs> because I tried my best. And the last set of words I heard, Madam Speaker, was the country is unproductive, and we need to be more productive. We need to more diversity. I also heard he said that. I also, I also heard he said, Madam Speaker. And, and I'm so happy that it's after lunch, and some people could just bring all this energy.
from us, right? But I'd still ask us to not shout across the floor, to continue cross floor. Cross Thank floor. you, Madam Speaker. Remember? You see, the truth hurts. Now, Madam Speaker, I heard something about he, this is what the Member of Parliament for Rugerty Brasen, we need to diversify the economy. The company, the com we need to be more productive. We need to do this, we need to do that. Madam Speaker, is he attacking the member from Diego Martin Ortiz, the Minister of Finance? I was at a loss to understand what side was he on. Normally he would leave that for us to say in opposition. But he did a very good job attacking the Minister of Finance. So I, I, I won't bother with that, Madam Speaker. You see, Madam Speaker, I liken the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. I look at it in layman language as a house. If you look at a house, you have a father, mother, children, etc. People belong to the household. And in the household, Madam Speaker, certain activities take place. You could call them little ministries. People do washing, cooking, whatever it is. Now, for that whole ecosystem to operate, it can't operate by itself. It has to operate in a manner where Whatever you're doing inside, you have to eat, you have to drink, you have to do whatever it is, somewhere that has to come from. You cannot live into your, in your own selves and end up elsewhere. And for that ecosystem to work, Madam Speaker, you must have revenue generated on the inside to purchase goods and services to run the household. And you cannot get, expect the father of the house, which could be considered the Minister of Finance, every morning to get up and take the money out of the pockets of those living in the household and run the household without bringing out anything to do revenue afterwards. This budget is exactly that. Correct. Taking things from out internally to run internally without producing a revenue generation stream. There is nothing in this budget to produce revenue. But what it does have is expenditure. Expenditure to the extent, Madam Speaker, where the internal people of the country will be, will be take, money will be taken from them to run the affairs of the country. And I want to say, I am happy he raised the minimum wage. I'm happy that he's increasing the OJTs, the 8,000 OJTs. I am happy for the people. But what is going to happen, I have heard nothing to compensate for small business. The small business and the small retail business, Madam Speaker, they are going to suffer because there's nothing in this budget to assist them in generating revenue generation, but it's more in expenditure. So you're going to have one, because of the rise in minimum wage, you are going to have people at the lower skill level losing their jobs. That we're going to have. Because the people of, <coughs> who are hiring them are the small and medium enterprises, not the upper and not the lower they are going to cost cut because they have to either raise the prices of their goods or the expenditure is going to increase. You have to pay minimum wage, you have to pay higher national insurance, you have to continue paying your green fund, your business levy, and all those other expenses has to be done. Now certain businesses are still at, at, that, at that level, not at, at basically breaking even level. So they will have to let go staff. And whenever the minimum wage goes up to such an extent, the lower skilled people are released first or the, or the, or the, or the business closes down, close down because sometimes they, they just can't afford it anymore based on the regulations. So you are going to see people, more and more people on the breadline, Madam Speaker. The other thing with the OJT, Madam Speaker, OJT is a good thing if it is used correctly. You see... May putting more and more people into OJT, Madam Speaker, what you are going to get, you are going to get a large amount of people going into the OJT program, getting high salaries, increase of 10%, etc., and then you're going to have less amount of those skilled people for the small and medium enterprises. So they are not going to get people to work for them at a cost that is above minimum wage, but equivalent to a certain level. Because they, are, they usually, in OJT, OJT pays very well for two years, and it's very difficult for those people to come back down to a private sector level or work in the private sector because they want to continue the OJT. 
So you're going to get a devo a, you're going to be devoid of a certain skill of labor. You're going to lose labor, but at the end of the day, it is all done, Madam Speaker. Unfortunately, in a time of, of not plenty, a time of less, to get votes. It's simple as that. Now nobody says don't try it for your votes. That's normal. Every government does that. But you are going to lose this part of the of the equation. <clears throat> People are going to lose their jobs. Maybe they didn't think of that. Maybe you think that you just say minimum wage is this. Sometimes you have to tie wages to performance, Madam Speaker, not just throw minimum on somebody, because a lot of small and medium enterprises now are having a hard time. If you look around the country, Madam Speaker, you will see more and more places up for rent or for sale. That wasn't so three years ago, two years ago, four years ago, five years ago. We have a lot of places up for rent. And that is an indication that the economy is struggling because nobody's renting. Nobody's buying to any extent. It is contracting, Madam Speaker. I'm not saying that because I want to score political points, but it's the reality of the situation. Another thing, Madam Speaker, foreign exchange in this country is difficult to get. We know that. There's a black market outside there. I think it's 8 to 1, some people 9 to 1, 10 to 1, 7.5, whatever it is. There's a whole different system outside the foreign exchange. But when you see the banks, Madam Speaker, the banks <coughs> tell you that for every person to purchase anything, your credit cards, you could have 10 credit cards, two credit cards, one credit card, your maximum amount of money that you could utilize is $5,000. Something is happening, Madam Speaker. Something is definitely happening. Because if you're curtailing your credit card access to foreign funds, you have to purchase it at 7.5 or 8 or 9 or 10, whatever it may be, to get your stuff done. <coughs> there is something happening in the economy that we are not addressing in this budget. This budget has not addressed any sort of, so sort of revenue generation or ideas to change some sort of things, Madam Speaker. You have to start thinking differently. Barbados and Guyana, they have done a system where you have foreign exchange, which is US dollars, US dollars and Bajan dollars, or US dollars and Guyanese dollars on one good, one good. And then you could choose to see which one you want to spend, which one, which one you're going to purchase. And it's all based on the exchange rate. Here, we are still stuck in the Trinidad and Tobago dollars and scrambling for US dollars to purchase anything. It's a global economy. We don't live by ourselves. No, we don't. We have a, it's a, a global economy. And if there's a global economy, you have to work with the global economy. You cannot sit down and say, we are Trinidadians, you must take our Trinidadian dollar. No, it's a global system, and the US currency is a global currency. So too, the UK currency, as well as this, the yen, and it's going to be soon the, the one. So we have to decide where we are going to go, Madam Speaker. And I'm just throwing it out again, because I'll throw it out again that it's time the Minister of Finance and the powers in finance look at the dueling or the dollarizing of the, of the economy in some extent. So we can now have the ability to accept US dollars and as well as, as release US dollars or Trinidadian dollars how we see fit. But when you see, Madam Speaker, that the bank is having a problem with credit card payments and credit card dollars, you know there is a problem, Madam Speaker, and the economy is contracting. And I'll tell you something, Madam Speaker. The unemployment rate in this country is high. No matter what you say in the CSO studies and the CSO, whatever it is, the unskilled, lower-skilled worker in this country, Madam Speaker, they're having a hard time getting jobs because if your construction sector is down, although your cement, your cement sales are up, but the actual construction system is down because all the different um, government projects are using cement. The government projects of the interchange, the Diadebe campus, the central block, everyone is using cement. But guess what they're not using, Madam Speaker? Labor. They're using cement because you're building. But the labor is Chinese labor. It's not local labor. So you're not using labor. So all these semi-skilled, unskilled laborers, etc., they have no jobs to get. 
because the majority of government projects are not using that labor. So what are they doing? What are they doing? They have nothing to do except turn to crime, Madam Speaker. So if you have unemployment to that, that extent, you can't eat. You're giving away your employment to other people. You see, when sales in the country, TCL is rising, but it's not given to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, this is what I thought the member Moroga Table and should talk about. Mm. That. Mm. Why is it? And he's in a side that he could look at it and determine where are we going to go. And I would expect that, Madam Speaker, I would expect that from a university lecturer. A uni like Dr. Tiwari, he, that's how he speaks. He teaches me like that, Madam Speaker. That we teach, we talk. I was having a discussion with Dr. Tiwari, and that's the kind of discussion I had with him. And that's what they call a university lecturer, Madam Speaker. <laughs> You see, Madam Speaker, <coughs> I just want to also, also say something about <coughs> my good friend, the Minister of Health. We have a very good relationship. We always agree to disagree sometimes. That's good. Now, Madam Speaker, the Minister of Health said this morning, and it, it, it fell in my garden, that the Arima Hospital was not financed, and the, the point fourteen Hospital financing wasn't available and a whole set of framework agreements, et cetera, wasn't occurring. Madam Speaker, the, we had a framework agreement with China and we were in the process right. of getting the, uh, we were getting the Chinese loan from the Chinese Development Bank. However, as I've mentioned before, our design briefs were finished. We were, the contractor was on board based on the Chinese ambassador, and we were doing nothing, just waiting on the loan to come through, Madam Speaker. And how a loan takes place, Madam Speaker, I'll tell you, it's a, a long story. The Ministry of Health has to link with the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who links with the Chinese ambassador, who then links with the Chinese, um, the Chinese government, who then sends it to the Chinese Development Bank who then has, it comes back this way, Madam Speaker, the same direction, into the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance. They then had negotiations, we could take about two years, Madam Speaker. We have our development brief, we have our, our they, they, they've already named the contractor, and what do we do? In every single loan, Madam Speaker, every single loan, the government pays 15% of the loan, and the, the, we get the loan at 85% of the total. We decided at the ministry to take that 15% up front and start the construction of the, of the Arima Hospital so we could have started breaking down and building. And when the loan came through, which was being negotiated with the Ministry of Finance, we would start to build more, so we have more money. And that is where I think well, that all this occurred around 2015, late 2014. We started putting structure stru stru in place. The Minister of Health is correct that the finance came afterwards, but it was all put in place by us. Yeah, man. But it had to be negotiated by the Ministry of Finance. So, nothing occurs instantly. It's not instant coffee. Nothing, it takes a process in, in government. It takes about three years to start for us taking the ground. The same thing, and he's reaping the benefit, and I hope he opens the hospital. I hope the Saudi minister opens the hospital because the people of Arima have been clamoring for that hospital for about 40 years. And we were able to start breaking the ground and giving them that hospital. The point 14 hospital, Madam Speaker, the point 14 hospital, we, were have, we had a framework agreement pending with the, ministry, the, the Austrian government. And having that framework agreement, we were, the Ministry of Health, together with UDCOT, <clears throat> we were having negotiations and we started the process of looking for another place to put the Point Fourteen Hospital. The Member of Parliament for Point Fourteen was Ms. Paula Gopi Schoon, Senator Paula Gopi Schoon, myself, ba um, Basan Barat at the time. I think it was the Minister of um, I forgot, yes. Trade. Trade. Trade, Trade Industry, and I think he developed up in planning. Ministry of Health. We went down to Point Fourteen, and we know what was going to happen to Point Fourteen, Madam Speaker. The Point 14 Hospital was going to be closed down and everyone 
who went to that hospital were going to be sent to San Fernando Hospital, way off, and, they were, and the Ministry of Health, this is what I met when I reached it, when I was there. They were going to open a small health office while the hospital was being built. Madam Speaker, together with <coughs> Minister Barrett, myself, we decided to change the, the, the location of the hospital to a more accessible area, but unfortunately, it had wells. So we had to cap the wells before we start to build. You can't build on the uncapped wells. So we uncapped the wells, we designed, we, the design brief was there already. We capped the wells, sorry. We capped the wells, the design brief was ready, and we were ready to move forward. So that is how Point Fortin started to be built, Madam Speaker. So it was another project that we had to take our time to move forward. Framework agreements and, and negotiations together with finance and everything else was coming on. You see, Madam Speaker, we were, if you want to do something small, if you want to do something small, such as the Diego Martin Health Center, which has been touted, you could do that in a year. But guess what? We had to do negotiations for five years on, with, with, I think, was, I forgot who it was, it wasn't Rebirt House, was I think one of the friendly societies, to change the land that they owned to give them a piece of land so we could start building the Diego Martin Health Center. Design briefs were being done in place with the Northwest Regional Health Authority, etc. So, Madam Speaker, I will not take it from the Minister of Health because health is not a political issue. It's a continuum. Yes. Health is a continuum. And it continues as we move forward, Madam Speaker, into where it's supposed to go in the next 50 years. We had, we had signed a contract and we had areas that are called the master plans for San Fernando, Port of Spain, and Eric Williams. The minister should look at that. It shows where the whole hospital system in this country is going to be changed. Not just coming and shutting down a central block because you're afraid that an earthquake will drop, will, will, will destroy. And we just went through, that central block just went through a 6.9 Richter scale earthquake and stood up straight on. But because of fear, it might fall, which it didn't, it hasn't, fall, it hasn't, fall, uh, it hasn't fallen since. You, 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 send, you, you basically took, you closed close the hospital and you sent all the patients off. Now you're scrambling for a place, as, Dr. Go, uh, as the minister, member for Karani, he said, scrambling to get a piece of uh, hospital somewhere in the eye clinic, different places, Eric, um, what they call it, St. James, or whatever. So, Madam Speaker, that in itself threw an unnecessary load onto the other institutions. So you end up now with a set of people lying down in trolleys in all the emergency sectors, all the uh, San Fernando, Eric Williams, Candy Grandi, wherever, even Port of Spain. So you have that problem going, uh, ongoing, Madam Speaker. And that is what's happening right now because of a decision. The decision, a decision causes the problem. Now, you have to anticipate the problem before making the decision and work, up, work backwards, not forwards. You see, the other thing, Madam Speaker, I want to just talk a little about the CT scan in the minister brought up in San Fernando. When I became minister, I wanted to put a CT scan and wondered why the CT scan was not working in San Fernando. I was told that a CT scan was bought by the previous regime and it was sitting in a container. Two years. So, I so Ministry of Health, we decided to build the suite for the CT scan. So we started building the suite for the CT scan. It took about a year and a half about that. And when we were about to put the CT scan into the suite built for the CT scan, Madam Speaker, the CT scan went in, but guess what? It, didn't, it wasn't functioning because rain had gotten into the container and destroyed most of the electricals in the CT scan. That, Madam Speaker, was not the fault of the then government. Whoever put it in that container and left it outside to the elements should be held responsible. That is what happened to that CT scan, but we were able to put a CT scan in the emergency unit in San Fernando Hospital, so people were getting the CT scan while that was being repaired. And the minister has, he is the one who has now, he has the problem with that CT scan, I don't know if he's gonna move it out. 
Another thing, Madam Speaker, which is a kind of a bugbear, Port of Spain is one of the largest catchment hospitals in the country. There's one CT scan there. Before I left the ministry, we were looking at, with Northwest Regional Health Authority, to put an MRI and a CT scan in Port of Spain, Madam Speaker. It's now four years going in five years. That has not been realized. The people of Port of Spain, they, are, they have no CT scan. No, sorry, no MRIs. They have to purchase MRI from external sources. Now, if it's done by design, is what I found out sometimes was be CT scans were happening like that. I would like the minister to, to address that and deal with that because there's a place already for the CT, for the CT scan. You might have to wait until the central block is finished before that. Madam Speaker, we had decided to change around the whole health sector. And together with the Member of Parliament for Karani Central, who was any Minister of Planning, we were able to work with the IDB to look at public-private partnerships, Madam Speaker, with diagnostic centers. You see, building a hospital all over the place with one, one diagnostic, one, one CT scan, one MRI, one this, one that, is not augering well for the population. And if you've ever been to Miami, you'll notice that there are standalone centers for MRI, standalone centers for CT scans, standalone centers for nuclear scanning, and PET, CT scanning, etc. They're standalone centers. Reason behind that, when the hospitals are taking care of their patients in-house, we need, or you know, the population needs, to go to an area that they can get the diagnostic investigations by not clogging up that inside the hospital. So we are building hospitals. Now I heard one was going to Grandy. Now Grandy was supposed to have the first diagnostic center. We were going to build the diagnostic center in Sandy Grandy with, together with the IDB. Two CT scans, one MRI, couple of ultrasounds, lab area, et cetera, in Grandy Hospital. That was what's supposed to be Grandy and duplicated throughout the country. So people would go there to get their, their standalone thing, standalone diagnostic. We were going to have standalone cardiac surgery centers, standalone ophthalmology centers, standalone neurosurgical centers, standalone ENT centers. We also were, were going to do a standalone oncology center. And that oncology center, Madam Speaker, would have had two linear accelerators. One cyber knife mo a um, linear accelerator, PET CT scanner, and ultrasound and di diagnostic capabilities for cancer itself, like MD Anderson, with a cyclotron producing radio pharmaceuticals. That has been shelved, but I see, I, and Minister can answer me, Minister of Finance, I see there is, is 1.6 million has gone to the on oncology center, which doesn't exist. This is what I found. And they could answer, the Minister of Finance may be able to answer, where is that money going to go, the 1.6 million for, that has been um, itemized for the oncology. oncology center. Madam Speaker, <coughs> while at the ministry, we, we did a couple of, of, of le um, legislative measures. The legislative measure, we, the legislative measure that we, we did was, we did the tobacco regulations, Tobacco regulations. We did the IAEA. Well, we did the IAEA. Started the IAEA nuclear energy regulations. We did the um, RHA amendment for good procurement of goods and services. The, we did the specialist qualifications legislation. We did the um, ophthalmological registration act. Changed it for the first time in this country. Opticians could dilate somebody's eyes to see in the back of the eye, which is called the retina. So you could determine in young children as well as adults the disease of the retina, such as retinopathy, et cetera. Now, the reason I go to legislation, Madam Speaker, two years ago, I started speaking about the need to decriminalize marijuana. Two years ago. It was met with some derision, which was expected. And it has now come almost full circle, Madam Speaker. And speaking with the leader of the opposition, I was pleased to, to know that she has taken kindly to that 
utterance and looked at it. And we have found that there is a need to decriminalize the utilization of marijuana for medical uses. You see, Madam Speaker, medical marijuana, and I'll give you a story. It came about looking at marijuana in the early days. When I was a medical student, Professor West in the, in the University of the West Indies Pharmacology Lab, Pharmacology, taught us pharmacology. He had extracted something called canasol from the marijuana plant. And it was being used as an eye drop for glaucoma very effectively in Jamaica. That could have been the start of the, now we wondered if he was just making a joke, but it used to work. People bought it in the actual pharmacies in Jamaica. There is a condition called Dravet syndrome, Madam Speaker. Called, it's a sort of an epileptic syndrome where people, where young children have constant epileptic attacks that cannot, that does not stop. The epileptic attacks continue onwards to such an extent that they hardly live past the age of five and 10. You see, Madam Speaker, um, a young girl was given the cannabis, was, was, he got the approval to use the cannabis. And the dramatic changes that occurred as use of the cannabis oil, CBD, with the Dravet syndrome and the epilepsy started to change the thinking of, medical of, of the utilization of medical marijuana. Medical marijuana is now used, Madam Speaker, for things like neurological problems. It's used also for bowel problems, muscular relaxants, and it's starting to be used, Madam Speaker, for Parkinson's disease. Now, that's one side of the coin, the medical part of it. How are they, however, because it's not decriminalized in Trinidad and Tobago, you have many young people who have been caught with a joint or two languishing in the jails of Trinidad and Tobago. And because of simple possession, heavy enforcement, call it the, the war on drugs, black market, and the law of the land, these people are serving sentences without bail, waiting to be their day in court, but going above and longer than the time they would have gotten if, uh, if they had gotten I mean, um, indicted. So they are then, and that, will, that, that part of it will, will, will disappear, Madam Speaker. The medical marijuana industry, industry is a $75 billion industry, Madam Speaker. $75 billion in 2025, up to, they, they project it to be in 2025, $75 billion. Nevada has earned $100 million in revenue by utilizing cannabis. There is an increase in the jobs related to cannabis, Madam Speaker. 22% and uh, it, it, it jobs are increased by 22%. It outpaces the national average of 10%. The non-medical use of it has, has been decriminalized in 15 states in the United States and legalized in 11 states. There is a public support of from 12% in 1969 to 70% today. It will boost the economy about $24 billion in 2025. These are figures from the United States. And it increases the tourism, banking, real estate, construction. All that will be increased in the utilization of the decriminalization of marijuana. You see, it can generate in this country, it can generate, Madam Speaker, valuable foreign exchange. You see, there are proponents for and there are proponents against. However, the utilization of medical marijuana, Madam Speaker, has shown that it is necessary, necessary and for the utilization of severe medical conditions that cannot be treated by conventional medicine. Conventional medicine, Madam Speaker, if you had irritable bowel syndrome, you had to do a lot of investigations taking intra interrectal steroids you have to use steroids that has its own problems, Madam Speaker. However, with medical marijuana, you just a couple drops of the oil sublingually, three times a day or whatever those doctors give you, you can definitely, definitely get a, a positive response, Madam Speaker. Now, 
Minister. Thank you for giving me, Member. And I'm glad you um, raised the issue of medical marijuana. You know what we are going to have to do? You and I, medical board, and all that? There's going to have to be a serious retraining of physicians because what is coming out of the United States now is that many people who are using medical marijuana are presenting to A&Es and they don't know how to treat either the overdosage or the drug interactions with medical marijuana. So all of us together have to come on board with retraining through TTME on training doctors how to use medical marijuana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And Yoki is correct, the Minister is correct, but the thing about it, what is happening, a lot of people, as you quite rightly said, the doctors have to know exactly the dosage. The, the dosage has to be uh, accurate and utilization with proper studies now. I think there's, there's need for proper scientific papers, scientific studies for medical marijuana. You see, Madam Speaker, I would, I, I would like to, to digress a little bit, digress a little bit from that. I just want to talk a little bit about CAFA, CAFA, which is the Caribbean Public Health Agency. CAFA, Madam Speaker, I've seen in the, I've seen in the, the, the allocations, CAFA, National Public Health Lab, and the National Blood Transfusion area is going to be moved to Valsin, which is, which is another project we had started off together with the Pan American Health Organization. And I'm extremely glad to see it being allocated to for the designs and the, and the movement into the, um, the Valsin area. The National Public Health Lab, Madam Speaker, is a mess. Is a, it needs to be done. We need to have a proper National Public Health Lab. And I'm very glad to see there's allocation for it. Also, we need to start looking at blood transfusion, blood, the blood transfusion system in this country in a, in a, in a, wider, a, a wider area, wider scope. We need to look and see if blood transfusion alone could be belong to the state or possibly recognized licensed public labs or for transfusion. Because trying to get blood in this country sometimes, it is a horror story and the minister will, will agree with me sometimes, you know? Now, CAFA, I want to give a little history on CAFA. CAFA, the Caribbean Public Health Lab, when I was minister in 2011, I, I went to the Pan American Health Organization meeting, and minister would know this. So 11 years prior to that, CAFA was being kicked around and bandied around throughout the whole of the Caribbean. I was able to, to take it, because nobody wanted it, Madam Speaker, because we cost and spoke to the leader of the, well, the then Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition today, and indicated that we should bring this CAFA into Trinidad and Tobago, set it up in such a manner that we would be like the CDC of Atlanta. And the Honorable Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition agreed. So we brought CAFA and we housed CAFA in Federation Park, where it used to be Carrick. And it has now been we, we, we started looking at developing an area for CAFA tied to the National Public Health Lab and the Blood Transfusion Service in the Valsin area that we owned a piece of land that was supposed to give me C40 warehouses. And that plan I see is coming to fruition again. And I'm extremely glad, as I said, that once again, there's continuity, Madam Speaker, in government. And I think government continuity needs to be looked at in a serious manner. And I'm very glad to see it being allocated for. You see, Madam Speaker, looking at, um, <clears throat> looking at this, the, some people might think it's a dry topic. But CAFA sees about the communicable diseases, more so than non-communicable diseases, such as dengue, vir dengue Zika, um, to, uh, malaria, tuberculosis, and all the other di di um, public health infectious diseases. It is on the ball with that. The non-communicable diseases, we started off, and I see that once again is allocation for the national wellness area for the NCDs plan. That was a plan, Madam Speaker, that we were able to yeah. work with the IDB for wellness centers throughout Trinidad and Tobago and the member of Parliament for Karani Central was the minister at the time. We were able to, to get that, that 
um, subvention from the IDB and the, uh, the, pro um, the approval. So we could have put a system in place, Madam Speaker, to look at childhood obesity, sugar, and all the other things that the Honorable Minister is going forward with. You see, Madam Speaker, we have a serious problem in this country of obesity. And if there's one thing we agree with is that obesity is a problem among everybody. It has gone from about 10% to almost 55 to 60% on the average. Our children are becoming fatter, and we need to do something about it. Even our young ladies and, and basically the testosterone level in young boys, the, the testosterone level in young boys are keeping them, are keeping them, keeping them slim. But Madam Speaker, it's a serious thing because the amount of, amount of complications of NCD, I feel very strongly about it. And also, the reason I feel strongly about it because I was educated by the blood, the, not the blood, the breastfeeding, the breastfeeding um, unit in the Ministry of Health and the breast, breastfeeding, breastfeeding um, tips. Pips, right here. Tips. Tips, right. Tips. They, they actually showed that utilizing breastfeeding decreases NCDs in later life. What we have right now, Madam Speaker, is a, is a forced feeding of children with, with um, formula. High sugar, high carbohydrates. Breastfeeding contains the, the correct amount of, of um, carbohydrates and the, and the correct amount of sugar. And it decreases obesity and NCDs later in life. So we started off by putting the Director of Women's Health, I remember, remember the Director of Women's Health, in the Ministry of Cabinet note, tied to the Director of Breastfeeding. There was a Breastfeeding Director. Um, and I understand that that has been looked at, the Director of Breastfeeding. It falls under, falls under the, the Women's Health. We had separated it out to have one. Yes. Okay. The reason behind that, Madam Speaker, we wanted to promote baby-friendly hospitals in this country, and I noticed, yeah, that is, that, that is where we wanted to go. The, the, the need for breastfeeding and the decrease in the formula in baby-friendly hospitals. Because, Madam Speaker, I will tell you something. When you start the addiction with the sugar of, a lack of, of the baby formula, it continues. And when, you have, when the children have sugar, fast foods, oils, salt, and those things, it's called a concoction. And that stimulates a part of your hypothalamus called your addictive center in your brain. And no matter what food else that you eat, it doesn't taste as good as if you're going to look for the fried food or the one with the additives. That is why children tend to, parents on the other hand, Madam Speaker, have to be strong enough not to give in. Parents have to be smart enough not to give in. You see, Madam Speaker, once your parents give in, you are making your children fat. If you're making them fat, you have fat adults. Fat, sorry, fat children make fat adults. Nowadays, the children, they have high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, and all that is going on in the young children today. So we have to work it in such a manner that the school nutrition program that we put in place, the Minister of Education, um, the Menopo Karanis and myself, we had what they call the red, green, and amber school nutrition program. And I see the minister is carrying it out together with the decrease in soft drinks, decrease in carbohydrates, and the low sugar system, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, that is with the NCDs. I want to turn to something, Madam Speaker, which, are, which are mental health, and I see the minister brought it up. <clears throat> mental health in this country is a serious problem. I, I remember saying about, about six years or eight years ago that one in four people in Trinidad and Tobago suffers from mental health, 25% of the population. That was met with a sort of derision and a gasp when I said it on a radio program. And I remember a call out, called in, and said, Dr. Khan is wrong. It had more than that. So he, he was, and I remember, I remember that, that, that conversation. You see, Madam Speaker, we've dealt with mental health. St. Anne's Hospital is a, is a mess. The minister will agree with us. But St. Anne's Hospital needs to be done, maybe broken down completely, sell, say, take the real estate money and put, as I say, community health system around place. We had 
Kuva, the old Kuva Hospital. We had a RIMA Rehabilitation Center. The Thakarika Center was supposed to be for the young adolescents, the new Thakarika Health Office. And we need community health centers around the place. Now, I won't really belabor that. What I want to say, <clears throat> and I want the minister to listen, as well as the minister of national security. You see, Madam Speaker, there is an invisible group in this country who suffer from serious mental health, but they don't get help. Who are these people? These are the children of incarcerated parents. Madam Speaker, these children of incarcerated parents, these children have their parents removed from them and incarcerated. Because they are under the age of 18, the visiting rights are almost negligible or not at all. One year original time is now spent. Thank you. We're entitled to 10 more minutes to wrap Thank up. You. you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> this, this invisible group of children, this invisible group of children, they are languishing outside, Madam Speaker, and they are seven times more likely to become truants as compared to the normal child, somebody with parents. These children of incarcerated parents we need to look at it, Madam Speaker, because there's a high population in the jails itself, mothers and fathers, single mothers and fathers and mothers. These children are either in, taken care by grandmothers, by, by aunts, uncles, and they are abused, Madam Speaker. Mentally, they feel deficient, they feel ashamed, and they look for outlets, Madam Speaker. And the outlet that they look for is either alcohol, gang-related activities, as well as substance abuse, and they become truant and they are seven times more likely to become, to become, as they say, the, the, the other group, like their parents, onwards. I would like the Minister of Health, and they have serious mental problems, to dedicate a place for those children to go to. Dedicate a place. Also, I would like the Minister of National Security to look at this, Madam Speaker, because there have been studies in the United States of America about these children of incarcerated parents, where they have bonding with their parents on a weekly basis, Madam Speaker, being able to go to specific areas in the prisons, made for be, to be friendly to these children. Over. I, I, I don't have much time to deal with it. I'm trying to do mental health. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I would like the Minister of National Security because when years ago when we, were, when we were speaking about it, we were able to get the children to, and to go into the, the, to meet their parents at specific times, Mother's Day, Father's Day, sometimes Christmas. But for this program to work together with a dedicated center for children of incarcerated parents, they need to, because to work on their mental health, and to decrease the crime levels, to decrease the amount of people going to gang activity and less substance abuse. Madam Speaker, you need to have that put on the front burner so we could deal with it. Madam Speaker, I just want to touch a little bit on the national health insurance system. We need a national health insurance system in this country, Madam Speaker. This national health insurance system, we started, we started under my tenure, the People's Partnership, starting laying the foundation for it. And I've noticed the minister have talked about medical records. However, medical records is there is only one part of the equation. You have to have some area to attach the medical records, to attach the primary care, secondary care, hospital, investigations, doctor's visits to one area, one secure area where it could be retrievable and accountable. That is what we, would do, what we had designed, the initial CDAP card called the health card. That was going to, as I say, attach all those parameters to one area that was going to be secure, name, and also records in one area. I, I, minister should look at that type of model. You see, Madam Speaker, that is the basis of a national health insurance system. Once you get that in place, 
You could then put costings as the, the minister has talked about costings, 500,000 of prime baby for an investigations, everything else in the cloud. So all this thing could happen in the cloud, man, as we can, you know, not much hardware. And it could be retrievable throughout the system. So the national health insurance and could be married together with public health, private health, such as Singapore. Singapore has a whole different ball game and also France. And the national health system, Madam Speaker, it uses that mechanism of approach. It uses linking because we have the technology now. In fact, the technology now is better than when we had it. Technology now is way advanced with artificial intelligence, etc. You see, Madam Speaker, it is time that we, now we've, we've heard year one, two, three, and four, I've heard the Minister of Finance talk about national health insurance, but he kind of dropped it off last year and there's nowhere to be seen in the budget this year. But I am starting to say that the, I've spoken to the leader of the opposition and she has promised me that in the first 90 days, Madam Speaker, of the new UNC government, yeah. when yeah. it does occur, one, the leader of the opposition said she will, she, the leader of the opposition will bring legislation to decriminalize marijuana. Two, bring legislation to allow children of incarcerated parents to visit their parents. And three, start the national health insurance system in the manner. And with these few words, Madam Speaker, thank you very much. Member for point four ten. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to contribute in this debate on the Bill and Act to provide for the service of Tran Tobago for the financial day ending on the 30th day of September 2020, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, let me, first of all, on behalf of my constituency of Point 14, and of course the wider Trinidad and Tobago, extend sincerest thanks and appreciation to the Minister of Finance, the Member of Parliament for Digo Martin Northeast, the Honorable Kam Imbert, for what I consider to be an excellent delivery and of course an excellent budget, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I also want to thank the Minister of Planning and Development, the Honorable Camille Robinson Regis, for her contribution to an excellent budget. Of course, all this would not have been possible had it not been for the guidance and the input of our Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, <laughs> when one looks at what is happening today in terms of the economic situation throughout the world, when you look at what's happening in our region, and when you look at the measures adopted in this budget, and you understand what the people are saying. It has been well received and it's an excellent budget, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, before going into my presentation, which will touch basically on the work done by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, let me just deal with one or two feedbacks based on the presentation before me. I also want to congratulate the speakers on this side, who as far as I'm concerned, did an excellent job in dealing with the, with the presentation, Madam Speaker. Excellent job. Madam Speaker, time and time again you hear on the other side justification for the start of the Point Forden Hospital. I heard it from the member for Caroni East. I hear it again, member for Baratara Sango. I am the MP for Point Forden. I was on the ground in Point Forden. I born and grew up in Point Forden. And yes, it was a hospital that has been talked about for almost 40 years since Shell gave us the area hospital that, we know, that now exists in Point Forty. But the claim that the past administration is making that they started the Point Forty hospital, Madam Speaker, is a sham. Madam Speaker, I can tell you that that site was literally a hoarding site, but galvanized by, around it and a conceptual drawing at the time we came in the power. About two, a month before the general election, there was a rush by the past administration to open everything, to open the construction site of the Cuba hospital, 
The Mayaro Fire Station, if you recall, Madam Speaker, the sign didn't last long enough, it fell off. And the similar move to open the Point Fortin Hospital, which there was not a pile was driven into that ground. There was still an uncapped well at the time, Madam Speaker. Yet you hear claims that we have started the Point Fortin Hospital. And the Point Fortin Hospital, Madam Speaker, was started under this administration. <laughs> under this administration, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I heard the member for Separia mention in terms of the Defence Force. And I want to join my colleague, the member for Dabadi O'Meara, and former Chief of Defence Staff, who said yesterday, he asked the leader of the opposition, the member of Separia, to stay out of the Defence Force business. I want to endorse that statement, Madam Speaker. <laughs> because the retirement of the Defence Force personnel is based on a long tested system. It is done not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but you'll find a similar kind of age and retirement combination in the Jamaica Defence Force, Barbados Defence Force, Guyana Defence Force, the British Army, the Canadian Defence Force, and even to some extent in the American military. It is unique to the military. So I also want to say, do not interfere with what is considered to be a total institution, one that is non-unionized, one that pays contribution towards their pension. And they enjoy what we call resettlement training to prepare the individuals, notwithstanding the early retirement, to be able to gainfully employ. If you need to address issues in the Defense Force, two things you need to address. One is the early accessibility of the national insurance. Because of the early retirement age, if you retire at 45, 47, 50, 55, you still have to wait until you reach age 60 to access your, your national insurance. The other one is the annexation of pension. That's another area that you want to address. If you want to deal with that, then deal with those two issues. But do not, do not interfere with the retirement age of the Defense Force. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development is mandated in, to treat with affordable housing solutions, regularization of squatters throughout the length and breadth of our citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And we do that through various agencies. The Housing Development Corporation, the Land Settlement Agencies, the East Port of Spain Development Company, the New City Mall, the East Side Plaza, Trinidad Tobago Mortgage Finance. Those are the institutions under the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. Today, Madam Speaker, I want to speak to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I want to let the people of Trinidad and Tobago know and be aware of what has been delivered to them between 2015 to date, Madam Speaker, by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. You see, Madam Speaker, the People's National Movement, the party under which this government falls, has been instrumental in providing housing to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, one can trace all the way back to the 1960s. The 1960s, when the housing project by government funded started, was under what was then called the self-help project. And even today, one can look at those areas and see the similar kind of architecture, the similar kind of structure in Point Fortin, in Guapo, in Labrie, in Pleasantville, in Mova, in the east, in some areas of Toko Sandy Grande. That was a concept that was developed under the People's National Movement in the 60s. And to date, Madam Speaker, this government continued that philosophy of providing affordable income, affordable and low income housing to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, when we assume office in 2015, we were faced with a situation where the economy was not what we, where we wanted to be. But notwithstanding that, we know that we have a responsibility to still continue to provide low and middle income housing solutions to our people of Trinidad and Tobago. And to a large extent, Madam Speaker, that is captured in our Vision 2030 document. And while to a large extent, on the other side, continue to say that there isn't a plan. Of course there's a plan, Madam Speaker. Our plan is anchored in our vision statement of Vision 2030. In particular, with respect to the Ministry of Housing, is in fact putting people first, nurturing our greatest assets. That's our tagline. That's where we are embedded as the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development on our Vision 2030 document. We always put people first, Madam Speaker. As a matter of fact, I mean, the People's National Movement always put people first. It starts with people. People's National Movement, Madam Speaker. 
unlike the Unpatriotic National Congress, that the U stands for. And so, Madam Speaker, we have continued to adjust to suit our policies in order of providing those low and income, middle income houses. The very first thing that we did in 2015 was to lower the income ceiling gap. It was then $45,000 per individual to $25,000 per individual. And the reason why we did that, Madam Speaker, because we realized that in terms of the accessibility to low income housing, a larger percentage was being captured by people in the high income group, basically between the 25,000 to 45,000 ceiling cap. And therefore, people at the lower strata were being missed out to a large extent. So the government took the first decision to lower that income ceiling from $45,000 to $25,000. Again, catering for the low and middle income persons, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, but when we came into 2015, we met a situation where, again, due to neglect, due to political vindictiveness, there were a number of stall projects. Stall projects that we met that were laid there, were never touched between 2010 to 2015. And I can testify to that. In Point 14, for example, the Lakeview Housing Development was never touched by the last administration for the five years they were there. As a, there were cows. Goods, vandalism took place in those structures. This government started, restarted that project. And I can count a number of different projects throughout the length and breadth. It was based on vindictiveness. I don't think the Prime Minister of the last administration ever visited Point 14 during that five years that she was there. I don't think she ever visited Point 14. Ne not, even to, not even to turn this out for the same Point 14 hospital that I mentioned a while ago. She wasn't even there when they did that. She never visited Point 14. So there was total vindictiveness in terms of providing housing for the people of Point Fortin. This government has taken that on board and decided that we must provide. And so Ministry of Housing and Urban Development also had to deal with starting new projects and completing, and completing those. Notwithstanding, again, the talk on the other side that we didn't, we have not come build one single building. I'll give you the details in a while, Madam Speaker, and the people of Trinidad and Bago to understand that we have started and completed buildings under this administration since 2015, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, you see, this government is not about wasting the taxpayers' money. Because when you leave those buildings incomplete for five years, Point Fortin, Valsain, Real Spring Valsain, I can go on and on. It's a waste of taxpayers' money because now you have to come back after five years, deal with those, some of them deteriorated to the extent where you have to be broken down and rebuild. So there was a waste of taxpayers' money during those five years under the last administration. Madam Speaker, let me itemize for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago some of the stall projects that this administration completed between 2015 to 2019. And I will itemize, Madam Speaker. We completed 2,067 units. Those were of stall projects between 2015 to 2019, Madam Speaker, 2,067 projects, and I will itemize them. <clears throat> These include 96 units in Chaconia Crescent, Diego Martin, 34 units in Malik Barataria, 264 units in Victoria Keys, Diego Martin, 137 units in View Fort St. James, 84 units at Real Spring Valsing, 336 units at Lake View Point Fortin. 72 units at Nepoyo Court, Malabar. 46 units at Hubert Stung, Wapu. 21 units at Kumuna, Kumana, Toko. 12 units at Brennan Tendo, Princess Town. 150 units in Borneo North. 281 units in Castle Gardens North, Carlson Field. 116 units at Eden Gardens, Freeport. 78 units at Pierre Road Library and 100 units in trust still there. But the Madam Speaker, these were all stall projects under the last administration that they never touched. They started under 2010 under the PNM government, and because of political vindictiveness, they were never touched. This government has completed those units, Madam Speaker. I see the government that cares, a government that does not concern itself with political expediency. Madam Speaker, it is projected that an additional 1,620 1, housing units will be completed. And these tall projects, we haven't completed. There are so many, Madam Speaker. We are still 
dealing with stall projects that were left abandoned by the last administration. We hope that during fiscal year 2020, we'll complete another 1,620 of these units, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, September 2015 to 2019, we continue to work on new projects under the Accelerated Housing Program. Again, I speak to the people of Trinidad and Tobago to understand what we have delivered. 232 units were completed at the following sites, Madam Speaker. 71 at Gomez Trace, Phase 2, Maruga. 24 at Woodster Villas, Bonnier South. 26 at Current. And 102 at Carina Gardens Arena. Again, a government that delivers, Madam Speaker. A government that delivers. 331 units are projected for completion 2019-2020 at sites including Carina Gardens, Current, Carlton Lane, Woodster Villas, Bonnet South, and Harmony Hall, Madam Speaker. See, Madam Speaker, the AGC is not just about providing houses, building houses. It's about building communities, it's about building communities so that the development of Trinidad and Vega could be expanded. Because by building communities, we build the country, Madam Speaker. So that we have done work such as street signs in our development. We have done work such as welcome walls in our de development. Directional walls, directional signs, speed bumps. And recently what we have been doing, Madam Speaker, in, in most of the developments is in fact within play parks so that the children can get activities, the children and the senior citizens can walk out and enjoy the ambience in those developments. We have also gone so far as to planting trees in some of those developments, again, based on the environmental friendliness, dealing with climate change and those kind of things. So we are building communities, Madam Speaker, in most of the development. So far, we have constructed 14 play parks in some of our developments. And I want to thank the corporate citizens who came to our assistance, in particular, First Citizen Bank, who came to our assistance in helping us, working with us, partnering with us to put play parks in some of those communities, Madam Speaker. You see, Madam Speaker, we recognize that the challenges that we met can be overcome to a large extent. Notwithstanding the economic situation, we feel that we owe it to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We owe it to those who are vulnerable. We owe it in order to try to eradicate poverty. We owe it in terms of providing that basic need of man and woman, providing that shelter that's required. You see, Madam Speaker, this government caters to the needs of all of its citizens, Madam Speaker. Over the last three years, we have provided the impetus to attract private sector contracts. Because again, the government, in fact, no government can really produce, provide the kind of housing requirements, housing demands in the citizens. In our case, we're looking at almost 170, 180,000 people in our database. The government certainly cannot provide housing for each and every one of them. As a matter of fact, even if we were to provide housing for 2,000 of those people in any one year, 3,000 in those year, Madam Speaker. By the time we completed those, another 3,000 would be added on because persons come to age, they put themselves on the database. So it's an it's a ever-ending continuum, Madam Speaker. Nevertheless, we will continue to partner. And so we have adopted two initiatives. One is a public-private partnership, and the other one is housing construction incentive programs. Those programs are the program design where we invite the private sector to join with government, to partner with government with certain incentive along the line to help us to distribute and provide houses for those who are require them in our society, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, under the PPP procurement arrangements, there are currently five private construction firms which are in design, finance, and build model. 82 units have been completed, 20 at Trust Trail, Diabody, 40 at Mahogany Court, Mount Hope, and 22 at Bamboo Creek, Kunupia. Again, a success story in the public-private partnership, Madam Speaker. It's projected that during fiscal year 2019-2020, 868 units will be completed under the PPP program. This includes 72 at current, 58 at Malabar, 428 at Trust Trails, 80 at Mahogany Court, 206 at Bamboo Creek, Kunupia, and 24 at Roy Joseph San Fernando, Madam Speaker. Again, a government that clears, a government that delivers, Madam Speaker. The Housing Construction Incentive Program is another program that we can talk about. Because any person or developer who has land or lands can be provided for you can participate in that program. The incentive, Madam Speaker, is that for houses that can be constructed under $550,000, 
the developer gets a 75,000 incentive for each unit that he's constructed. Between 550 to 750, the developer gets $100,000 for each unit that he has constructed. Madam Speaker, that has been going quite well. But we want to invite and encourage more of our private developers to join the incentive program. We'll go out and market that under 2020 again. Madam Speaker, currently there are 71 units being constructed under this initiative with a projected completion date of 2020, in, in fiscal year 2020. Another one of the stall projects, again, that we met was the Victoria Keys. And again, Madam Speaker, when we met Victoria Keys, we realized that the last administration had changed the whole concept of low- and middle-income housing. They build those, I don't know if they had stakeholders involved in it, I can't say, I don't know. But they refurbished those apartments of Victoria Keys that, and the cost were in fact above what we consider low and middle income owners. This government took a decision then that because of the cost of the construction, they had to subsidize it and put them on the open market. We had to put it on the open market. That decision taken by this government, that's because of the cost of those, those units at Victoria Keys. We still not understand what it is, what was the intention of the last administration, because if they're building houses for low and middle income, the cost of those construction at Victoria Keys is designed for something else. And so, Madam Speaker, we have been able to sell a number of those units. As a matter of fact, 121 of those units have been sold, earning the government a revenue of $232.5 million, Madam Speaker. $232.5 million. There are still some units to be sold, and, and I know that they'll be sold probably by the end of fiscal year 2020. Mortgage conversion rates we continue in terms of earning income for the people and government and the continual housing structure. We have been working with Trans Tobago Mortgage Finance in terms of converting mortgage of renter owned, licensed occupied. And so to date, we have collected over $1.5 billion, Madam Speaker, in revenue from September 2015 to present. $1.5 billion as income coming in from conversions of mortgage sales. So the, the Housing Development Corporation continues to provide income to sustain the housing development throughout the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. One of the areas that we have, been, have made some headway again is in our delinquency, delinquency rate. As you know, Madam Speaker, our rental units throughout the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago, there was a, hard, a large delinquency rate where persons were not paying their rent on time or sometimes not at all, sometimes owing the agency for three months, four months, as the case may be. We believe that that's revenue lost. And that, again, we believe that people must pay for what they have been given. And so we have developed and we have put in place a debt collection agency that goes out with a car written on the door, written on the door, agency debt collection. And they come in front of your door and, tell, and let, so your neighbors will know. Because the persons who are not paying their rent, they have sometimes two vehicles parked up in the car, in the, in the, in the porch, in the driveway. And they have all the amenities of good life, yet the rent is not being paid. So we haven't been able to reduce that significantly. So it's reflected that almost uh, there's been a $33 million reduction from 2018 and 2019. And we continue to do so, to reduce it to the extent where little or no one owes the agency rent for apartment that you're living and enjoying, Madam Speaker. You see, we're making the people more responsible and try to get away from this handout syndrome because you have a responsibility to pay your rent before some of the other items of enjoyment. Madam Speaker, this government understands quite well, quite well what it is we have to do. As I mentioned a while ago, 175, 180,000 people on the database is by no short feet and uh, uh, something that we can deal with. But what is happening thus, Madam Speaker, is that as we continue to deliver as we continue to distribute houses, it, it means that there are some successes that's showing. So people are seeing the distribution of houses, and therefore, they come into the database. So success breeds success, and in other words, Madam Speaker. So while we are trying to reduce the amount of people in the database, by merely distributing houses, we are encouraging people to say, there is something good there, so let me put my name on the database. So the, the numbers continue to be almost around the same, or even increasing as we go along, Madam Speaker. And that has to do with the good work 
that the Housing Development Corporation is doing, Madam Speaker. And I also want to thank the contractors. I want to thank the contractors who are working alongside the agency for delivering and distributing these houses, Madam Speaker. I want to again commend the Minister of Finance because in terms of funding the development programs so far as housing is concerned, he has come up with some creative and, and, and innovative ways to provide the funding necessary. Again, to meet that demand of 180,000 people on the database. He has done so, notwithstanding the challenges facing for us. And I want to compliment him on one of the initiatives in this, this budget that we're dealing with, Madam Speaker, and that is the housing bonds. The Minister of Finance has amended the Government Saving Bonds Act to, to include a housing bond. He has extended the amount from $2 billion to $3 billion to cater for that. And that housing bonds would go a long way. It's a sort of a win-win situation, Madam Speaker, one in which those who are encouraged to purchase these bonds at 4.5% interest, I repeat, Madam Speaker, 4.5% interest. So those who are en encouraged to purchase these bonds, it comes like a saving for them for investment in future. But at the same time, the money from the bonds can then be used to construct new homes, to develop new communities, and so on. So it's a win-win situation for the people, and of course for the housing development, for the Ministry of Housing, and of course for the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And I encourage people, good initiative by the Minister of Finance, Madam Speaker, very good initiative by the Minister of Finance. And know that that will go a long way in treating with the housing stock of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, another initiative that was mentioned in the budget, and this is where, again, the Minister of Finance, taking into consideration that we need to encourage some of our small contractors, make, create the environment where we can encourage them to participate in the housing, in the housing construction industry. And so part of the budget measure dimension had to deal with the costs encouraging small contractors to build houses at a cost of $500,000. And those small contractors, as you mentioned, will be given in any development, let's say the development of 100 units, you can have at least 20 contractors, small contractors, giving them five units each. Five units each. And then based on the performance, next development, they may get 10, development, 10 units each. But each of those small contractors, you can imagine the multiply effect, Madam Speaker. Those small contractors coming to work, delivering, and again, it's based on what AGC has put in place at 21 point quality control measures. So they're, they're not left alone. They'll be given the plans, the drawings, the architectural approval, the tongue and country approval, the infrastructure development, and is monitored by the agency, so it's built within agency specifications. But the important bottom line here is that it's creating employment for the small contractors in Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. Another part of the budget that's mentioned by the Minister of Finance is the low interest loans that be provided for the people of Trinidad and Tobago of $300,000, a low interest loan of $300,000. So Madam Speaker, when you combine those initiatives, the $300,000 provided at a low interest is really the tip of the iceberg. In. Because now we're providing you with the $300,000 low interest, providing you with construction, and then when I tie that into the LSA, which I deal with a while ago in terms of the provision of land, you'll see that there are a combination of things that are put in place by this government to treat with low and middle income persons with the genuine aspect of being able to access and build or occupy, purchase your own home, Madam Speaker. What, what else can this, what, what's government can stand like this, Madam Speaker? No other government can say that they have done this combination of activities. The budget, Madam Speaker, is a very good budget insofar as housing is concerned, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I turn a bit now to the Land Settlement Agency. Land Settlement Agency is built based on regularization of squatters, but also in terms of providing lands and so on for the constructions of homes. And to a large extent, they have been very successful, Madam Speaker. Very successful. The Land Settlement Agency has been successful in a number of ways. Still, utilizing the same philosophy of persons, catering for persons with an income cap, income gap of $25,000. The land settlement agencies have been able to provide fully developed lot under the government-aided self-help programs. How does that operate, Madam Speaker? 
we do have designated lands in Trinidad and Tobago. We have developed lots that have been developed by the land settlement agencies in terms of infrastructure, so that lights, water, roads, drainage have always been, has already been developed on these lots. It is based on random selections. To date, we have been able to, there were 5,000 applicants. Out of that, 1,000 were based on random selection. To date, we have interviewed almost 700 of those. And I can say, Madam Speaker, that the public, people of China, because 500 of those have qualified to be able to build their own homes on this land. The criteria is simple. You must be 21 years of age. You must qualify for at least $320,000. And you have two years with which to build your home, Madam Speaker. Two years. Two years. In normal situation, you have three months if you're doing a bridge in finance and so on to build your homes. Under this program, the individual has two years, 24 months to build this house. Sometimes you can even build that from your monthly salary, Madam Speaker, if you really want to, without taking out a loan. Because you have two years. You have the plans drawn up for you. You don't have to pay for the plans. You have the infrastructure in place, roads, lights, and water in place. And you have a supervision. We provide you with a project manager. What else, ladies and gentlemen? What else, ladies and gentlemen, the government doing providing houses for the people of Trinidad and Tobago? And this program, Madam Speaker, has been very successful. As I mentioned a while ago, 503 persons out of the 700 randomly selected have been approved by the Trinidad and Tobago Mortgage Finance to date. The, to date, the 332 sale agreements have been completed and signed by the leases. 194 applicants, applications for persons with land who requested financial assistance and technical support have been processed. In other words, you could also have your own land and benefit from this. It's not just state providing the land, but if you have your own land and you want to build, you can also access this service. We are provided with the same facility, architectural drawings, um, project management, and so on, and of course the loan. Madam, when you combine that with the 300,000 low interest loan, you get the land, and the land, Madam Speaker, is sold at 25% uh, of the market value. 25% of the market value. So in other words, if the land costs $200,000, if it costs $200,000, then you pay $50,000 for that land. So Madam Speaker, it is a win-win situation. It's a win-win situation. <coughs> Madam Speaker, another initiative by the in fact, let me just mention, there are also development in these areas and so far as the land is concerned. In La Romaine, in Glenroy, Princess Town, Alambi Street, Golconda, also in Kunupia, in Felicity. So the land is spread out throughout, the, throughout the, a number of different areas in Toronto and Lago, so you have some choices. Even the persons would, you have choices in the areas in which you would want to build your home. Madam Speaker, I want to touch on another program that was mentioned by the member for Maruga Tableland, which is the Housing Village Improvement Program. And he went at length, because the program started off in Maruga, as he mentioned, under the guidance of Dr. Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. When his walk around saw the kind of living conditions starting with Americans in Maruga, in Samuel Cooper Drive, when he saw that, he made a promise. As a man of his word, he kept his promise, Madam Speaker. But that was the model. That was the model program for that, Madam Speaker. Very successful. Very successful initiative. Very, very so, so successful, Madam Speaker, that that program won the IEDB Award for Innovation and, and Excellence. First prize. First prize for Innovation and Excellence for 2019, Madam Speaker. I see, Madam Speaker, the program builds on what people my age would call probably the GAIAP system. In those days, people used to come together and build the homes. The ladies will cook the food and so on. The men would mix the cement, lay the bricks, lay the foundation and so on in, in, in the village area. Of yeah, course, the, uh, there's libation. already be some libations. Some libation. But even the children partake in that, participate in that. I remember as a child in South growing up in Point Fortin, when you're building a home, everybody came together. The children would carry water and throw it in the cement when they're mixing it. Or carry water for the workers, for the people who in the, in the trenches and so on. It's a similar concept that's being used in this low-income housing that started off in Maruga, where the community comes together, but today you don't get anything for free. So you employ the local contractors. So you have the local contractors coming together and ensure that the local contractors from within the community itself. And he employs people from within the community. And when you do that, Madam Speaker, you're contributing to the development of various communities. But it's people billing for people within the community. Everybody knows one another. And what I saw in Maruga 
the kind of structure that I saw, when you saw the before and after picture, you'd be amazed at what is happening. And when you hear the people from themselves talk about their understanding and the belief from what they have received, Madam Speaker, it will shock you to a large extent. And so this HBIP program has been able to deliver 30 homes in Maruga. 10 homes were repaired at the same time. So the, those who needed repairs and those who needed total constructions. So there were, in fact, 30 new homes. 10 were repaired. But also, we don't just do the homes and the repaired. We did drains. Mm -hmm. We did sidewalks. We did roads. So it's a really enhancement of the community. We still have to do a little community center for them so that they can meet and treat and talk in the marketplace. It's about developing communities, Madam Speaker. This is what this government is all about. Yes. So Madam Speaker, under phase two of this, and I said, based on that, we use that model. But in terms of going forward, we say, let's do a social survey. We do a social survey throughout the length and breadth of Trinidad and Bigo. We had uh, about 116 young people, young people to go out to the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago to do a social survey for us. And the LSA, I want to congratulate them. They have a new tool using technology. These young people went out with a, a handheld device, like an iPad. When they come to your home, they have your name, as you're punching your name and so on, it goes right back to the LSA on a map that's mapped out. So we can pull up that database anytime and say, John Brown lives here, John Brown has two children, his family has two children, two boys, two girls. We have that. Those were these young people were able to do. So we had employment, but we were able to map out those areas in Trinidad and Tobago right now. And it's based on the social survey, we then determine where we can expand that program to. So to date, Madam Speaker, we have done phase two and Moruga continues, and the member for Moruga Tableland has mentioned it, but I'll give you some numbers. He didn't touch on the numbers. There are 20 units in Moruga, 30 in Marabella right now, 32 in Sandy Grandi, 20 in St. Joseph, and in this phase, employment is created for about 600 persons. Using the same concept, and we continue the social survey throughout the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago. So there are more areas under 2020 that we hope to expand based on the needs, based on the requirement. And these houses, Madam Speaker, Build the initial ones, pilot project, would build at a cost of $100,000. We learn from some areas and so on, so we increase those in phase two to $120,000, Madam Speaker. Where else you can get a house? A house that you can do, for, you can safely occupy it. From a before after, before, wooden shack, no floorings, toilet outside, to one in which you have a concrete, solid concrete house, a solid roof over your head, toilet and bath inside. I went recently to Rampanagas, where we delivered some of those houses. And one lady showed where the houses was before, and the present one. She actually did the walls and everything inside. Beautiful two-bedroom house, Madam Speaker, for $120,000. $120,000. Beautiful, beautiful concrete structure for $120,000. This is a government that cares. This is a government that provides for the low- and middle-income people of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank the LSA for that initiative, for going out there into the fields and providing much needed ease to those people, Madam Speaker. You see, the LSA also, Lancet Manager, also continues to do pre-construction work, which we have done at 10 sites around the country, including Demara Road, Arima, Off Rochard Road, Penal, Off Rochard Road, Penal, Wabande, Sandy Grande, La Philippine, Grand Cova. And these are sites that have been designated under the Act, under the Land Settlement Act. So we do the infrastructure work for these sites in terms of roads, in terms of drainage. Yes, Madam Speaker. We also do infrastructural work, pre-construction and infrastructural work. We have done infrastructural works in 30 sites, and 14 sites have been completed to date, Madam Speaker, with a yield of approximately 2,600 lux. This is delivery, Madam Speaker. I want the people of China to be able to understand what I'm saying. I'm saying this for the people of Trinidad and Tobago can see what has been done in the housing sector in Trinidad and Tobago, based the housing and also the land settlement agency. 2,600 lots out of those 30 sites, Madam Speaker. And these sites include areas such as Agbarali Trace, Arima, Glenroy, Princess Town, Harmony Hall, Gasparillo, Jacob Hill, Wallerfield, La Pile, Caroni, Pine Settlement, Sandy Grandi, and others. I can go on and on. You see, the LSA has also infrastructural projects related to regeneration of communities in greater Port of Spain region. You see, that's the urban part of the military housing and urban development. We also treat with developing and looking at areas in the greater Port of Spain areas that stretches from Carnage in the west all the way up to Mova Lavantil, Lavantil in the east in terms of the greater Port of Spain area. And so 
The LSC has awarded 38 contracts under this program. 23 of the projects were completed in several areas, including Scorpion Village, Caranach, Factory Road, Digo Martin, Waterhole, Kokorit, and some areas of Belmont. Madam Speaker, roughly 200 persons from these communities were employed to work on these projects. I treat with another area that's under LSA right now, it's quarter regularization. The land tenure of number 25 of 1998, Madam Speaker, says to us that the only time that we can recognize anyone to present with a certificate of comfort, he would have, have to apply or would have been on the land before 1998, but it was extended to October 2000. So anyone after that cannot be provided with a certificate of comfort. So there's some people who figure that they are new squatters and they come and they ask the city of The law does not allow the government to give anyone a city of comfort who entered into state lands after 2000, Madam Speaker. And you were supposed to have applied for the city of comfort before the deadline of October 2000. But there are some that have applied and have not been processed. The Land Settlement Agency processing those persons who have applied within that window after October 2000, will not present with a certificate of comfort. Madam Speaker, in keeping with that, the Land Settlement Agency has been truthfully doing something that never happened before, that never happened before in this country. You see, there's a three-stage process. There's one certificate of comfort is the first stage of that process, given the persons who had applied before October 2000. So we present you with a certificate of comfort. After the certificate of comfort, we move to the statutory lease. The statutory lease is a 30-year lease which is provided for you. And during that 30-year lease, you ask to pay for the land. That land, Madam Speaker, is at 25% of the market value of the land. Again, I'm going to use the example to illustrate. If the land costs $200,000, the individual, the applicant, pays $50,000. And that $50,000, if you're given your, when you're given your statutory lease, you have 30 years to pay that. Madam Speaker, the calculation that worked out about $1,600 a year, roughly $138 a month. For an individual earning a piece of land for $200,000, they're paying $50,000 for it, and they can pay $138 per month for 30 years statutory lease. Now they can pay it off before that. So if you pay it off before that, you're now entitled to a deed of lease, Madam, Madam Speaker. The deed of lease is 199 years. Madam Speaker, which government? You buy, you gain a piece of land worth $250,000, paying $138 a month. And when you pay it off, you get a, a deed of lease for 199 years. This is the first time any government has moved this process have uh, moved this process from certificate of comfort to statutory lease. Never happened before. Notwithstanding the rush on the last administration to give COC, 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 COC. They never moved the process forward. Not one. They never moved that process forward. People are still in a state of certificate of comfort, which has no collateral, has no bearing. All it tells you that you will not be ejected from the government land. We have said we have moved that process now to move you from COC to statutory lease. So you have a sense of comfort. We have something that can pass on from generations to come. As a legacy, Madam Speaker. Oh, man. As a government working, caring. government that caring, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, over the years, Madam Speaker, the number of squatters have increased exponentially since we came into power. And it was encouraged to a large extent by the large administration. It was almost like a free for all. Because you see, people on the belief that once you go on the state lands, you get a city of comfort. It was encouraged by the last administration. Between, especially to the end, when they see the end was near, in 2015, 20, 2014, 2015, they encourage a free fall to the extent where we have forests being destroyed in Sandy Grande, in Toko Sandy Grande. Two of the largest areas by LSA's mapping of squatting right now is Toko Sandy Grande and Point Fort in my own constituency. And that was encouraged. And people of the false belief that they presented a certificate of comfort, they're good to go. But just go on the land and live and you get a certificate of comfort. We cannot give anybody a certificate of comfort who did not apply up to October 2000. That's the law, and we haven't changed that law. So those who are going and building the state land, they would not move that process. The process cannot be moved. 
because we have a map of everybody who were there before and after, Madam Speaker. And we'll continue, Madam Speaker. We'll try and see how best we can help. And so, Madam Speaker, we continue with that survey again to see what is the true picture, what's the mapping picture. The survey is designed to really to assess the current level of squatting and the real and potential impact of informal settlements throughout the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago. To date, 240 sites and 28,000 structures have been mapped on state lands. I repeat, Madam Speaker, 240 sites and 28,000 structures have been mapped on state lands. And that's why I talk about the young people going outside their employment, using technology to get that information almost at your fingertips. It's employment for them, but also give us the kind of data that's required. And that data can be used otherwise. Other agencies can use that data. So social development, family service can use that data because the data is there. Tongue and country plan can use that data. So it's the data that we have captured and we're willing to share the technology with across ministries. But at the end of the day, it's a whole of government approach that we're dealing with, Madam Speaker. So Madam Speaker, the Land Settlement Agency continues to do its job in terms of squatter regularization in terms of moving again people from COC to statutory release to deed of lease, Madam Speaker. Another initiative by this government with respect to housing had to do with the whole question of financial arrangements. You see, Madam Speaker, again, the government and its policy in housing had to look at the financial capability or ability of individuals. And so one of the measures that we did under the Toronto Bigel Mortgage Finance was to look at the interest rates. And so, working with the TTMF, we lower the interest rates to 2% and 5% respectively. 2% and 5%. The 2% persons who are working for a salary cap of $14,000 and below, they are entitled to a 2% from the Bay mortgage finance. 2%. So that an individual with a TTM mortgage... Who... Number 4.40, original speaking time is now spent. we entitled to 10 more minutes to wrap up. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the, housing, the Ministry of Housing has so much to say that time will not permit me to say as much, but I will wrap up within that time. Thanks a lot for giving me that. The 2% and the 5%. 2%, as I said, the cap at $14,000, individual or combined household, <coughs> you are entitled to a 2% mortgage. And that's something valued up to about a million dollars. At a 30-year mortgage, an individual can get a million dollars at a 2% for 30 years. Over, over $14,000, between fourteen and 25000 which is a cap, you can get a 5% based on your salaries, of course. All right. So do, that, again, is an initiative done in partnership with TTMF and the government. So we've lowered the interest rates. So we're making the land accessible. We're making the interest rate that we're making the, lowering, the loans, loans at low cost. Madam Speaker, as a whole, something that we're doing to ensure that people of Toronto Bay will get what is required, the basic needs of man, shelter, land, owning your own home. And we continue to work with the TTMF. And another thing, Madam Speaker, you see the 2%, no down payment. You don't require a down payment for the 2%. So those people who are working for under $14,000 with the TTMF, you get a loan at 2%, you don't require a down payment. You can go straight and you get 100% financing. Madam Speaker, this government is one that cares and works. Cares and works, Madam Speaker. Our Ministry of Housing and Urban Development continues with this grant. We also have two grants, the Home Improvement Grant, which gives individuals, based on assessment and based on random selection, $15,000 to improve your homes. Again, it's based on, uh, based on cost checking to see your situation. Once you are selected, we have to see where the situation is, whether it's required you, if, based on your income and so on, whether you're entitled to that grant. And you get first half, $750,000 to do repairs. When we see that has been done, we do an assessment again. And then you provide it with another $750,000 based on what is required to improve your home condition. We also have the emergency shelter grant. That is based, again, on individuals who are, had to experience um, emergency hazards and so on, such as fire, floods, and so on. We treat with that in the emergency shelter grant. So another $15,000 that we make available under this government for those who have been so exposed, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we have done an exciting exercise recently, that's about two Saturdays ago at the Hilton. We did what is required, what we call an, expo an exhibition. And we developed what we consider called the, the manual called the Know-How Guide in Housing 101. Why we did that? Because several 
citizens come to the ministry asking about housing, how to purchase their own house, how to do mortgage, how to rent, sell, and the case may be. We package all that into one book called the Housing Manual 101. We had a launch last Saturday at Hilton, and we also invited exhibitors to come and show products and so on. We had banking in, in institutions, we had home developers there, yeah. and so they were all there. Madam Speaker, we were overwhelmed. There were almost 2,000 people turned up to that function. We were overwhelmed. People from the Hilton Ballroom back to the car park, people were in the line from 10 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon because housing is something close to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And we provide them with that on the spot assessment by TTMF, on the spot assessment by some of the banking sector. Alternative solutions. In fact, there were some developers there who were able to produce housing at a cheaper cost than HGC. So giving people the alternative. And we're glad for that because the 180,000 people, we cannot provide for everybody. So if there are private developers who can produce a house for less than the AGC, we could want to partner with you also to get the prices down. But they were all there. I'm sorry I didn't have the member Tabaki to come, and, but to come and, and exhibit with us, because I know he's also in the housing sector. But anyway, there was, there was overwhelm, Madam Speaker. And I want to compliment. I want to, <laughs> and I want, I want to compliment the, the Ministry of Housing, especially the Permanent Secretary. Yeah, I, I, I apologize for that next time. We, we're going to have one in South. It was so overwhelmed that we planned to have one in South, and I'll ensure that you have an invitation member for Tabaki. Madam Speaker, let me quickly talk about urban development part of the ministry. Under the East Port of Spain development, we have done several works throughout the length and breadth of Port of Spain. 16 development projects comprising 44 physical infrastructure projects, 16 projects under the social and economic program for East Port of Spain were delivered. 42 44 physical infrastructure projects were done by small contractors and employers within the community. 250 pit latrines were replaced by modern bathroom toilets, done by local contractors, small contractors within those areas. Three community impact centers have been upgraded in Chinapu, Trumaca, Never Dirty. State-of-the-art recreation facilities have been constructed on existing recreation facilities. Recreation grounds at the Beatum, at Pleasant Park, Boxing Gym at Barcelona Street, Silas Eats Play Park. Cultural facilities have been done in Panyard Upgrade Program. All these are being done by the East Port of Spain Development Company, Madam Speaker. Garbage disposal platforms have been done, constructed at Poinsettia Drive and Picton Road. See, over 400 youths completed a youth entrepreneur program in order to develop the culture of entrepreneurship. 111 persons have been trained and certified in construction skills and heavy equipment operations. This tra tra training was facilitated by MIC and NESC, Madam Speaker. The government that cares. Residents have also participated in soft furnishings, art of fine dining, cooking, boxing, and glass engraving, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, again, people of the Gonzales community, a very good um, initiative here, training in business. The Gonzales Food Park, located in Gonzales, was established to develop an urban agricultural sector in Spain. Urban agricultural sector, Madam Speaker. They grow and sell the agricultural produce, and they also encourage an agri-based business, Madam Speaker. This project has benefited an investment of $65,000, and it's well worth it, Madam Speaker. The people are encouraged to do agri-business in the urban part of, of, of Port of Spain, Madam Speaker. Eastside Plaza and New City Mall continues building and local and small business entrepreneurship, and you continue to do that. Madam Speaker, let me take the last couple of minutes to talk about my constituency here, point four. I have much more to say but time doesn't permit me so to do. But Madam Speaker, I want to thank the people of Point Fourteen constituency for giving me the privilege to having to serve them for the last four years of this government. Madam Speaker, Point Fourteen constituents have been very supportive, are very supportive to us, to me as the, as the MP, but also the government of Trinidad and Tobago. We have seen some capital projects in Point Fourteen constituency, such as the Point 14 Hospital, which is due to deliver next year, Madam Speaker. By this government, Madam Speaker, by this government, we have seen what I call the highway from Point 14 to San Fernando. Yeah. Well on its way, Madam Speaker. Well on its way, Madam Speaker. We started, we started it and we did it, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we have seen the construction of the pavilion at the Mahaika Oval, Madam Speaker. No, no, no. Mahaika Oval, Madam Speaker. Madam, no, 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 we start that. No, 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 don't take no claim. We have also seen, Madam Speaker, the start of the geotechnical survey for the lands to build the Point 14 fire station, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, 
All yes. capital projects, Madam Speaker, there are other projects. Community center in Tiche, lights in Buenos Aires, lights in Punta Trace, lights in Fullerton, sports field, community center upgrades in New Village, community center upgrade in Guapo. Madam Speaker, this constituency of point 14 is, as I always say, point 14 is PNM, and PNM is point 14. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker I want to thank the people of Point Fortin for being patient. But once again, when we finish Michael Oval, we'll move on to the Civic Center. And once again, Point Fortin will restore to this glory of being the cultural hotline, the cultural center, and the sporting center of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, I thank you very much. Member for Tabakate. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And let me say how happy I am to join this very exciting debate. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, too much cross Firstly, let me uh, express my gratitude to my constituents of Tabakit. Somebody mentioned this might be my last budget speech. Who knows? Nobody can uh, determine what is there in the divine plan for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Madam Speaker, I've been very happy to serve my constituents. I thank them for being very understanding, very supportive, and very patient um, in the light of the development they required and perhaps that which was delivered. Madam Speaker, the Honourable Member for Point 14 and the Distinguished Minister of Housing spoke about the program to build the houses for 90 to 120,000. It's a commendable program, that one that I was, in fact, doing while I was minister um, with URP under my control. And there are several um, poor families, very poor families, who have really benefited from, from, from that program. And the, one of the important things that any government must do is always focus upon the vulnerable in the society. If you do not focus on the vulnerable in the society, and if you cannot make plans for the vulnerable in the society, then you are going to have social problems of a kind that you would not be able to deal with um, in the long run. But while you spoke about housing, you also said that no government is capable of providing all the housing that people require. And I agree with you. And this is where it is very important that the private sector um, be motivated and inspired to enter the housing development sector and to provide um, accommodation. However, being a developer myself, and again I declare my interest, I just want you to know that I'm a registered developer with the HEC, I'm registered with the FIU, I've met all the, the, the necessary um, things that I need to meet as a developer. Let me say that we need, through the Ministry of Planning in particular, to speed up the bureaucracy in terms of this, the system of approvals. Only a couple of days ago, I referred to the Honorable Minister situation where if you go to the San Fernando Office of Town and Country Planning, you will see that they state their um, 60 days as the regulated time in which they will respond with a plan. But what has been happening is that they will wait 60 days. And if there's a simple problem, only on the 60th day they will call you and tell you, come in to check the plan. Come in to check the plan. And I, I had a plan there. And I wanted to bring to the attention of the minister, and it's the first time I ever did it, just to show her what was going on. And it took me 71 days in the town and country planning division to get the plan passed. And I want to say to you, Madam Minister, that situation arose after I spoke in this parliament and criticized the town and country planning division. And I'm very sad that people are applying political um, victimization simply because I happen to be in a business which... Um, which uh, they have some kind of responsibility. I think it's very sad. I don't want to press my case here. I'm not doing that. But I press the case for developers as a whole. Because developers who know that I'm in the business are coming to me and saying, why don't you go and, and, and make representation on our behalf? And they're afraid to make representation on their own behalf because they're afraid of political victimization. Believe it or not. Believe it or not. So, no, I'm not saying you're victimizing me, madam. Not at all. You help. You help. But I think that you need... Yes. No, no, no. You help to unvictimize. But you need, you need to go in there and deal with it. To deal with it. An officer must not be allowed after a person visits a, a, a site 
in the first 30 days to wait 30 days before they contact you. Yeah. Officers must, must not have abrogate that power unto themselves. As I told Mr. Lee Hunt, it's also happening at WASA in the new services department. So I think it's, 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 uh, it's taking too long for the developers to get their approvals, and therefore that is causing um, construction to be laid at a time when the construction sector is down. All you're talking about selling cement and so on. That's to the big projects. But even the small projects, you cannot hire the skilled laborers and the unskilled laborers. You're going to have a big problem. So the, separate the c cement sales to the big projects from the cement sales to the, the housing sector, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And there are many, many persons who are now without jobs, skilled persons without jobs. The other thing I'd like to suggest to the honorable member for point 14 in terms of housing is, Minister, I'm not happy with the quality of houses still that are being built. And I want to suggest to you that we live in an earthquake zone in Trinidad. And despite what your architects and engineering design consultants are telling you, I think that every house in this country, whether it's a single story house or a house on stilts, must be piled at least 10 feet. I, I am I'm saying to you that, that, because when an earthquake takes place, it is your foundation that is going to hold, hold your house. And a lot of those, those houses, as you know, are not being piled, and they are building on trenches, and sometimes they are building on the trenches with, with half-inch steel rather than five-inch steel and what have you. So that's something you've got to, got to look at. And uh, to the Minister of Planning, all I would like to say is that, you know, town country has allowed one super developer in Chaguanas, Caribbean Housing, to build houses on less than 5,000 square feet, and it's a, a facility that's not being afforded to other developers in the country. And I think that in itself has to be examined. Why are you giving one person the, the, the power to build houses on between 3,000 square feet and le, uh, about there, or 3,300, and you're not allowing other developers to do the same? What is the reason for the particular kind of zoning that, um, that is being spoken about? Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I want to begin my contribution with the following quote from a very respected journalist and researcher, uh, Mr. Curtis Williams, in the Business Guardian of October 2019. And this is what he said. Minister Imbert has spent the last four years increasing taxes on businesses and some individuals, slashing government expenditure, refusing to pay billions of dollars in bills, in an effort to stabilize the economy from the shocks that it faced post the screening, the seeming permanent fall in crude oil and natural gas prices. To a large extent, he has been successful in at least getting the population accustomed to having less support from the government while maintaining inflation at a manageable rate. But in doing so, there has been a reduction in demand. There has been private sector, a fall in private sector confidence in the distributive sectors have been, the distributive sectors have been damaged and the country continues to fail in its effort to improve the ease of doing business. And I think that is a fair criticism of what has happened over the last four years. The country, the, the economy has not been diversified, new streams of revenue have not been identified, and like my colleague from Baratara Samoa has said, you know, we are at a situation where everything is still pegged on oil and gas and oil and gas prices, but really there are no new streams of revenues um, that will um, take us out of the shocks that are so inevitable, it seems, in the oil and gas sector, particularly in a situation where in the United States, shale gas is, is available so much now, and what is happening in Guyana you know, puts some kind of damper upon our own um, resources here. In this parliament, we have had a very interesting situation in this debate. The Minister of Finance presented his budget. And one would have thought that he would have a, map, a more clearly mapped out plan as to where this country would be going in the next uh, five years. And if you notice very carefully, there has been no real debate on what the minister has said, because there was nothing to really debate. And it is in this context, I think, that I must, along with my colleagues, as they have done, congratulate the leader of the opposition. Because in my, my recollection of parliament, it is perhaps the first time that a leader of the opposition 
after making her comments about the budget in the first 20 minutes of her presentation, mm -hmm. she presented what I would like to term an alternative development agenda for the country. An alternative. I don't think it was a manifesto. It was an alternative development agenda, a practical approach to reconstituting and reconstructing this country in the next five to 10 years. A developmental agenda which proposed a strategy to increase non-energy revenues, reduce expenditure in critical areas, and put the nation on a path to prosperity. And as I said, it's perhaps one of the very first occasions on which an opposition has shown that at least 12 months prior to a general election that it is preparing and will continue to be prepared and be prepared to take over the reins of government and to create prosperity for everyone in this country. I think what the leader of the opposition has shown is that there's a new level of confidence in the United National Con Congress so that 12 months before an election, we could present an alternative development agenda to the population of Canada and Tobago. And this agenda is, I, con I consider it to be an agenda for sustainable development where it reduces the emphasis on gas and oil. It reduces what I like to call the vagaries of, of price and revenue associated with the energy sector. And it is an agenda that will generate new streams of revenue and foreign exchange, manage climate change impacts, enter the world of renewables and renewable energy, thus giving real meaning to the concept of a sustainable economy. That is what this alternative agenda does. And the population, tired as they seem to be, of having to hear for four years who and who and who again are to blame, finally are getting an opportunity to listen to answers to their questions from the leader of the opposition. The question they ask, what are you going to do as an opposition? They were waiting to hear this because they know the choice they have to make. The choice between the government and the opposition, which is a government in waiting. And they got several of their answers. And over the next few months, those answers will be amplified and the details of the strategy will be presented. You see, we must never as politicians underestimate the intelligence of our population. Even the very young ones in the primary schools. They want answers. And now they have an opportunity through the presentation of that alternative development agenda to analyze and decide. And the role of a responsible opposition is not only to alert the people of the impacts of government policy upon their livelihood, but also to convince them that there is a better way. And the UNC has provided in its alternative development agenda through the lips of the opposition leader that there is a better way. But Madam Speaker, what is going to be the deciding factor? You have the PM and you have the opposition, the UNC. The deciding factor is going to be who is more capable of providing the quality of leadership and the implementation skills which will make a difference to the country in the co con context of the citizens' agenda. Because if you examine what the citizens of the country are asking for, and you examine the developmental agenda of the UNC, you will see that there's a matching of minds. There's a matching of minds. The leadership, you see, promised by the PNM in the run-up to the 2015 elections has not been provided. It has not materialized. Had the leadership been provided, had the leadership materialized, this country would not have had to peg its economic future only on oil and gas. Had the leadership been provided, the ease of doing business would have improved in this country. And the Minister of Trade would not be standing up two weeks ago saying that we are going to do something about the ease of business. Four years is a long time to have done something about the ease of business. If the leadership had been provided 
People would not be lining up at 3 a.m. in San Fernando to get a birth certificate. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People would not be lining up at 6 o'clock outside, 6 o'clock in the morning outside of the Chaguanas passport office to get a passport. People would not be begging for an appointment at the passport office and would have to wait weeks and sometimes two months to get a passport. And if the leadership had been provided business confidence, resulting in the kinds of investments that this country needs outside of the oil and gas sector would have, in, in fact, improved. In fact, the Minister of Finance has said in his budget speech that private sector credit went up, from, I believe, from 57 billion to 59 billion. But what he did not say is that that private sector in investment was not really investment, but a lot of it had to do with people reconstituting their loans. Refinances. Sorry? Refinances. Yes, and consolidation and refinancing their Refinances. loans. And there's a vast difference. And that is why you're not seeing investments in terms of an expansion of the economy and the economic base. People have had to do things to save their businesses in this country. And that is, that is, that is where that $2 billion have gener generally gone. This country requires a leadership that inspires. It requires vision, but also demands strength to initiate changes. And we initiated changes we, we, when we were there in the People's Partnership. If you look very carefully, you may not want to admit it. But today, tourism is, is struggling in Tobago. Mm -hmm. And Trinidad is known for its business tourism. Mm -hmm. But had the right marketing emphasis been placed upon the aquatic center, upon the National Cycling Center, upon the Tennis Center. And had we used, for example, the fact that we have one of the highest um, number of birds in this country, we could have had a vibrant tourist, native tourist. You can say what you want and criticize Mr. Anil Roberts as you want to criticize him, but he had a vision which he brought to the cabinet. And he knew that in the winter months, if you market it properly, you have gotten cyclists coming from um, away to train here and the swimmers coming to train here. Let me also say that I see a real connection between that National Cycling Center and the recent performances of our cyclists winning gold yeah, yeah, medals. Yeah, yeah. It proves the point that if you uh, provide the environment for people, people are going to become creative and their potential will become uh, to the max. But leadership, what the opposition sorry, has demonstrated with its, I call the ADA, the Alternative Development Agenda, provided by the leader of the UNC, leader of the opposition, is that we on this side are ready to provide the leadership the country needs. You see, but leadership itself is something that can only be offered if you have something to offer. And you have to be prepared. Tell them. And the fact that the PNM has not been able to provide the leadership is because they never had a plan. <laughs> there was an illusion of a plan. And when we told the country that they never had a plan, the country didn't believe us. But now the country has come to the realization that, hey, there was, in fact, no plan. Therefore, we are going nowhere. And we are like Alice in Wonderland, standing at the crossroads and asking which way to go. But with the UNC, you know which way to go with the alternative development agenda. So preparedness means the existence of a plan which has been presented. That's the first thing. PNM declared it was ready, but there was no plan. No plan to create a diversified, sustainable economy. Now, the second element of leadership required is one that replaces hopelessness with hope and opportunity. Not just hope. Hope is one thing, but opportunity is what is really important. No government, none, can provide all the jobs. But the role of the government is to create the conditions, create, some people say environment, I like to say conditions, wherein people feel hopeful and see opportunities to build a life, to build a life. Where there is hopelessness, Frustration develops, and the manifestation of frustration is withdrawal from the society. And when people begin to stand on the periphery of a society, looking at the society, they become critics of that society, 
Cynicism develops, and you have a dangerous situation uh, coming to hand. It has happened in other countries, and it's something we must avoid in this country. It is this withdrawal as a result of frustration that affects creativity, affects our competitiveness, and affects our productivity as a nation. The very productivity that the Prime Minister himself has complained about. It goes to the point where people question whether people love this country or whether they are patriotic. The opportunities for building a life, for building a family, contributing to society and nation is embedded in the alternative development agenda of the United National Congress. And some people may think that this is something that just came from nowhere. It didn't come from just nowhere. We have spent four years thinking and rethinking where we went wrong. We have not been sitting idle. People have been asking what the UNC has been doing. We have been preparing to return to government. That's our objective. You can, you can work as an opposition. But when you really want to make a difference, you have to get into the seat of government. And you get into the seat of government by providing people the alternative choice. Rich, rich, rich. And in developing the alternative ad de development agenda, hundreds, I tell you, of consultations were held with stakeholders, Correct. with investors, current and potential. But more importantly, we held consultations with one of the most important stakeholder groups in this country the young people of this country, the young people of this country. Today, people, even within our party, are criticizing when they see so many young faces on the front bench of the Senate, not realizing that the role of the opposition and the role of government are to ensure that the young people are involved in the governance of the country. Because if they are not involved in the governance of the country, they will either go away with their talent to some other country, and you will suffer your own development in the future. My dear friends, your development agenda must reflect the aspirations of young people, or you are going to fail as a country. Fail because you need to capture the energy of your young people. For far too long, our young people have not been as intensely involved as they can be in the shaping of the future economy. They have not been involved. Our young people are bright. Yeah. Our young people are industrious. Our young people are entrepreneurial. Very, very entrepreneurial. There are hundreds of examples in this society where young people are doing things. I give you two exam one example. There's a young man in Claxton Bay in the constituency of the member for Point of Pierre. And he has an associate degree in political science. But for two years, he has been unable to get a job. But he has the ability to make um, murtis of Hindu deities. And he also makes chulhas. And I saw this on the Facebook, and I called him. And I asked him, you know, I want to buy one of these chulhas and so on. Because I was excited by what he was doing. And then I, in talking to him, I discovered who he was in terms of his education and so on. And he had no compunction to doing what he was doing, although he had an associate degree in, in political science, I believe it was. At Rizzoni's restaurant in Port of Spain, two Saturday nights ago, I, I met a young man who was serving at the table. And uh, his accent varied between some Caribbean country and Trinidad. And in talking to him, I realized he had a degree in public administration for three years and couldn't get a job. And he's serving at the table. Wow. Wow. I'm just saying that to tell you what is happening to our young people in this country. That we are producing young people, but we are frustrating them by them not getting involved in jobs. So that, so that Madam Speaker, if you simply come to the parliament and say, I'm expanding the number of jobs available under OJT, that doesn't solve your problem. Correct. Correct. That does not well solve said. your problem. Well that said. will come to an end in two years. And in any case, I think that the OJT program is not properly supervised. That people are being sent to do OJT jobs, but they are doing less than what their qualifications provide them. They're not being matched to proper jobs. They're not being matched to proper jobs. 
Madam Speaker, one of the underlying principles of the way that the United National Congress will function in terms of the ADA is to partner young persons to create the future. Develop the, the diversified economy that is necessary, but too late in coming. And our young people are the ones now who have to come forward. And therefore, I want to propose, like we are proposing when we get into office, that there's a different development model that's necessary. And that different development model will entail partnering with young people, a state organization partnering with young people in which young people will set up their companies while they are even at university. And the university must therefore change its business development um, courses so that people can launch their companies there and by the time they leave after three years, they are into business. And where the government, the government can in fact be part, partner of that company and eventually divest that shares back to the, the student who becomes the entrepreneur. You need a new model for developing entrepreneurs in the country. Young people don't have the money, but they have the talent. True. And we have to have a new model for business development so our young people can feel part of the business elite in this country. The young people can become their own 1% or 10% 1%. or what have you. You don't want that. You don't want that. And the AD, that Alternative Development Agenda, provides the opportunity for the UNC to do what every responsible political party should be doing providing a new age of opportunity for the entire country. That's what it is, a new age of opportunity. It's not just about a new UNC. The UNC is always there, it has its history. It's about a new age of opportunity being provided by the UNC. The UNC is in a better place to provide the leadership this country needs, a better place. It's because of its preparedness, because of the confidence that the UNC through its political leader and this team of persons here. You see, the UNC is not about um, one up, one, one leader. The UNC is about shared leadership. That is why when the political leader got up to speak here and the opposition leader got up, she reminded the, uh, the country that the members of this team will be dealing with the specific portfolios because they all have the intelligence and the capability and they have demonstrated that capability and that intelligence in the past. Our duty to our young people is to inspire and usher, usher in a new generation of leaders for the future. Now, one of my concerns about the budget presented by the Honorable Minister of Finance, is the divergence between what the government has presented and what the people would like to see in the budget. The people's agenda is reflected, in my view, in five questions which I'd like to ask on their behalf here today. Five questions. And these five questions are as follows. One, what, how are you going to protect citizens from the daily onslaught of crime? How are you going to protect them? I applaud, I congratulate Commissioner of Police Gary Griffith for his efforts. I think he's making a difference. When he was appointed, I said we needed an operational leader and that he could provide the, the operational leadership skills. I said also that there's going to come another point in time when he has to become an inspirational leader um, to the police service. And I, can, I will see those changes taking place because leadership is a function of the situation. That's first crime, question. How are you going to protect citizens from the daily onslaught of crime? Secondly, what would you do about this lost generation with the thousands of youths who see crime as a way of life? What would you do with them? And I've begun to give you my answers. You have to give them sustainable employment. They cannot get it in oil and gas. And therefore, you have to be creative. And that is what the alternative development agenda provides. Thirdly, what is your plan for stimulating the economy and getting people back to work? Is it a reality, Madam Speaker, that in an economy that is already struggling to provide jobs for its citizens, maybe about 
15,000 jobs have now been taken up by Venezuelans. And have we put 15,000 persons on the breadline? Is it a fact? Or is it that, this, that people didn't want to work before, and these jobs were always available, and the Venezuelans came in and took these jobs? But it's a question that has to be asked, because in every business you go, in every warehouse you go, you find Venezuelans working, and working very hard. So it's something that has to be asked. Fourthly, how are you going to achieve more transparency towards good governance? Which is what everybody is asking about. You know, there was a recent report came out from Transparency International that dealt with the whole matter of um, perception. I may or may not have the report here. But um, people did, in that report, people did say that um, under this present government, they perceived that uh, corruption has increased. And that's Transparency International. That was the same Transparency International under Derek Murray, who every Monday morning would be hitting out at the United National Congress. He gets a job now. He has become excellency. his excellency. He's a good man. Yeah, Taking 25 catches in the English series and creating a record. Yeah. Yes, for what I do know something about cricket. And finally, how are you going to achieve non-energy revenue but not only by taxation. But not only by taxation. So these are the questions I ask that, in my view, constitute the people's agenda, the citizens' agenda. Now, does this budget contribution made by the Minister of Finance answer these questions? Has the government answered any of these questions in its previous contributions? Has the government's announced programs in its budget ever led to these questions in the minds of the population being answered? Is the government considered to be a good government by the citizens of the country? Because it then begs the question, what exactly is a good government? A good government is one which closes the gap between the spoken word and the delivered action. Oh, yeah, yeah. You close the gap. Swami. Has this government been closing the gap between what it promises and what it has delivered. And, and there, 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 there's, there's a vast difference. You know, for example, for example, what has been the track record of the current government? How many promises have they really delivered during their tenure? Madam Speaker, in, in an article entitled Budget Amnesia, Budget Amnesia, in the Business Guardian of October 3rd, 2019, uh, this question of budget amnesia was picked up. And it's a Curtis Williams article. And uh, he said here on September 8th, uh, sorry, last year he told the parliament, referring to Mr. Imbert, the growth and development of the economy is further, being further facilitated by the recent decision, recent foreign investment decision by the China Harbor Engineering Company Limited to establish a maritime business anchored on a dry docking facility at Labrae in Southwest Trinidad. On September 7, 2018, uh, NITCO and China Harbor executed a cooperation agreement for the development over a three-year period at a cost of 500 million, over 3 billion TT of a range of businesses, including construction of large container and bulk transfer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What has happened? He will also unlikely talk about the aluminum plants that we expected to have started construction to date, not a word on them. What about the new industrial uh, estate at Phoenix Park, Kuva? Last year, he talked about, Madam Speaker, in collaboration with the Beijing Construction Engineering Group, we are developing a new modern industrial park in Phoenix Park at a construction cost of 104.3 million US, et cetera, et cetera. It's called Budget Amnesia, this article. What has happened? What has happened, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, for the past four years, for the past four years, the government has spent or budgeted to spend about 203 billion. And it has taken on also $24 billion in additional debt. Mm -hmm. So this government has, has, has borrowed to support. But what has it supported? Has it really supported investment? Investment that will bring a stream of revenue to the country and affect a, a sustainable economy? Of the $203 billion spent, or to be exact, $202.33 billion spent in the 2016 to 2019 fiscal years, 
92.4% was in recurrent expenditure. 92.4%. That's money spent on wages and salaries, transfers and subsidies, goods and services, and interest payments. Only 7.6% of the 202.3 billion, some 15.5 billion, was used for capital expenditure and net lending. And that was according to the July Economic Bulletin published by the Central Bank. 7%. You see, the point I'm making is this, huh? that policies of borrowing money, taxing the population, extracting money from the HSF, and sale of state assets have not really worked in the interest of the country. And that question will be answered when you go down on the ground and begin to walk the ground, and you'll see the reality of the ground, how people are suffering. And people are really suffering in the country. That's not, that's not whether you're PNM or whether you're UNC, people are suffering. And the suffering of people, I talked about the vulnerable at the beginning, it has to be attended to. It has to be attended to. Something must be done. See, Madam Speaker, there are many issues, you know, that we can mention to show the poor track record of the government. But there's a difference, and that's the difference between the government and the alternative government in waiting. The difference is between those who talk and those who perform and deliver. That's the difference. That's the difference. You see, to move this country forward, the private sector involvement is critical. It's critical. You're not going to move this country forward without private sector involvement. You, the state alone cannot move this country to prosperity. It is in this incarnation, this government, in this incarnation, has demonstrated inefficiency and incompetence. The state companies continue to be a colossal drain on the Treasury. The government says, for example, the government says, for example, that they need rate increases at WASA and TNTEC. Let's examine whether the expenses at these organizations are, in the first case, due to poor management, bloated organizations, and really, Situations where workers would go to do a job at 9 o'clock in the morning at TNTEC, like I have seen with my own eyes, and I will say it, even if they take advantage of me saying it, and park up until 3 o'clock when they can begin to collect overtime and then begin to work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would not sit on this opposition and try to win a vote by not talking the truth. I will talk the truth in this country. Because when we come into government, we will have to deal with the situation of productivity. We will have to deal with the situation of people making a fair contribution for a fair day's wage in this country. Very well said. And it's time that somebody picked up the gauntlet and say it as it is. And if you are going to impose this upon people, then you have a problem. But at the same time, if you get into renewable energy, you might be able to save people costs. If you give people... Um, Give people the opportunity to invest. You know, overseas, BP and Shell and so on are using their platforms to invest in, in wind farms and what have you. Why can't we encourage them to do it right here, Mr. Parry, Member for Parliament for Mayaro? Why can't we do it? I don't know if my colleague, Mr. Ganga Singh, MP for Shogunas West, remembers, but we attempted to ask once of um, people at TNTEC about wind farms, and we were shut down. They said it was not possible. Why can't it be possible? It is very serious. Very, very serious. So the private sector, we have to look to them to play a greater role in stimulating economic recovery and transformation. <coughs> if, however, doing business is frustrating the private sector, they'll become uninterested. They'll take their money elsewhere. And the private sector is showing a lack of confidence, evidence, by lower borrowing for business and a very heavy 33% unutilized manufacturing capacity, Dr. Tiwari, unutilized. This means that the Ministry of Trade has been deficient in its marketing of products from Trinidad and Tobago. The only thing that matters at the end of the day is how much you can sell overseas. This is a limited market, not just in CARICOM, but beyond the CARICOM um, borders. 
All the achievements that the trade ministry boasts about amounts to zero. <laughs> Winning this award and that award and so on, if it cannot manifest in increased sales and capacity utilization in this country. Correct, correct, correct. The Honorable Minister, uh, Mrs. Gopi Schoon, is a very nice person, very, very uh, affable person, but she's an incompetent minister oh, yes. in terms of doing what she's doing. The private sector is becoming frustrated at the ease of doing business, which has gotten worse since this government came to power. The World Bank, ease of doing business ranking rated Trinidad and Tobago as 66 out of 189 countries in 2014. Sheep. Today, just a few years later, in 2019, we have fallen from 66 to 105. Sheep. Sheep. What, sheep. what has gone wrong? Sheep. What has gone wrong? Sheep. Madam Speaker, listen to Dr. Roger Hussein, economist. I know the member of, uh, for Digo Martin, Northeast, doesn't like to hear the economists, he had a lot to say about Mala Dukaran in one of his commentaries. But Dr. Hussein points out that with respect to construction permits, in 2004, Trinidad and Tobago was ranked 77, whereas in 2019, we are ranked 125. He's an engineer. We have some of the lowest cost of electricity in the Caribbean. However, on the, jet, on the getting electricity sub-index, it has progressively worsened from a rank of 10 in 2014 to a rank of 41 in 2019. Whoa. Madam Speaker, you really have to be a member of parliament sitting like where I sit in my office to understand the frustrations. People have to get a connection to their house, a new connection, a new connection. Madam Speaker, the minister announced to the private sector that he's given them like $3 billion in bonds. No problem, that's nice. And Madam Speaker, you know, really, I want to put on the table that nobody is going to buy those bonds from people, even if they're transferable, at the same price that the minister has set it. Correct. You charge people 15% interest when you don't pay your taxes, but you're giving the people 1.5% for their money. You are using private sector money to finance government expenditure because you are bankrupt. Are you bankrupt that you cannot make, pay your bills? And therefore, you're using people's money that they need to finance their business to finance government expenditure. That's a serious situation. So people are losing. If I could be getting a return, I just say a minimum of 5% on my money as a businessman, and I'm getting 1.5%, and my money has already been held up there for a number of years, what is really the net present value of my money right now? You know, it is... It, 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 I, I have to ask these questions on behalf of the private sector because it's the private sector you increase taxes upon, you know. Mm -hmm. right. The business levy, green fund, well, everything, everything went up. The private sector cannot continue to pay this cost. You're going to frustrate them. This is why the honorable leader of the opposition said that we have to ease the private sector by reducing the, the, the taxes and giving them a chance to expand so that more people can get jobs and get employed. You don't fight crime by leaving people unemployed. You fight crime by giving people opportunity. The age of opportunity for the future, that is what the UNC is, is all about. So, Madam Speaker, you know, in a report published by the Inter-American Development Bank in January 2017, it was reported that in Trinidad and Tobago, getting an electricity connection takes 35% less time with an illicit payment. For water connection, the results show that paying a bribe gets your connection in 19 days compared to 23 days if no bribe is paid. Import licenses, this is the World Inter-American Development Bank. Eh? Import licenses are received in nine days when payments are made, but firms that do not pay have to wait as much as 18 days. Jitindra Khadan, an oil and gas smothering the private sector in Trinidad and Tobago, IDB January 19, 2007. Is this government aware of how business is being negatively impacted upon? How can we seek to stimulate business in an economy where this is taking place? We need to encourage, we need to reinvigorate the private sector. We have talked in long enough in this country about diversification until the very word has become a national cliche. We would not be able to diversify, as I said earlier, unless we change the model. Diversification has to go hand in hand with entrepreneurship and the act I use the word emphasis, the active development of entrepreneurs. 
A new model is required. I want to repeat it for the benefit of the government. State must partner entrepreneurs, and the university must develop business incubation programs. We are teaching people at UWE, but are we creating functional people? Are we creating people who are not going to become, and the first time I heard this word from my friend Dr. Tiwari, state dependent, but rather independent functionaries in the society. What can our graduates do when they really come out of our management studies program at UWE? What has happened to our agriculture um, degree at, at university? Why can't, why can't we, uh, at the university, member for Chogonas West, who comes from the agricultural sector. Why can't we change and reconstruct that program? So the first two years, the student goes to school. But then in the next two years, the student is placed on a five-acre or two-acre farm. And the student is allowed to develop a business and then comes back for the final year or final two years in the university. So we create, we, we create a, a person who can see the earnings from agriculture and put their skills to work and develop their skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the same university you just gave away. You gave this $500 million to. And they are not doing anything to change the manner in which they are creating new models for the development and for human development. I'm a photographer. It's your original uh, 45 minutes are now spent. You have 10 more minutes to wind up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Speaker, teacher. The, 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 the global energy revolution demands that we reduce our dependence on oil and gas. It demands it, and we have to do it. Madam Speaker, as we all say this, and let's not forget the importance of earning foreign exchange. There has been a 33% decline in the net official foreign reserves, from $10.46 billion to $6.99 billion between the end of September 15 and the end of June 2019. You have to turn around that. You know, it was Mr. Jerry Brooks, Professor Jerry Brooks, uh -huh. Yeah? Speaking, uh, one of, one of them, speaking at Export TT's Innovate to Export Seminar on the 11th of September 2019. And he stated as follows, and I respect Mr. Brooks. Eh? He says, while the energy sector has improved, the challenges which beat with BPTT and the future of Atlantic LNG's train one looms in the background. He said, energy and the old energy flows and oil flows will not take us any further. Will not take us any further. So it seems that we cannot continue to have an uncertain future. We must make an instantaneous leap into areas of manufacturing which can earn vital foreign exchange, but also employ people and their opportunities. Madam Speaker, the question that the government has not answered and the question which our alternative agenda for development answered is what does the world need that Trinidad and Tobago can produce? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't just produce anything, you have to produce what the world needs. And the alternative agenda, the political leader and leader of the opposition outlined areas of an foreign exchange. Let me give you an example. Take, for example, the banning of teak. I love that. Ban, ban of teak. Teak logs are being exported. Now, rough teak was banned in 2014 under the new teak and pine policy. But it was a policy placed for the benefit of local sawmillers, furniture manufacturers, and downstream users since the teak is sold at subsidized prices. But where have we gone with this? What do we do? We continue to allow people to employ knockdown furniture in the country from Italy, from Canada, and so on. Nobody should be allowed in this country to bring in a kitchen set of kitchen cabinets unless it was made right here in Trinidad and Tobago. You want to develop the furniture what? industry, protect the furniture industry, protect know. the people who are doing it. They don't know what. what has happened to the program in secondary schools where all the equipment was there and you were training people to use this equipment and to be good woodworkers and so on? Listen, there's a, there's, there's a company, companies, companies uh, in Sweden, in Sweden, have what is known as the knockdown furniture, right? IKEA, the IKEA effect. You just assemble it when it comes to you, and they send you a screwdriver to do it, and you do it, and you do it well. Why can't we do that? Why can't we do that with a Phillips screwdriver and an Allen wrench and a rubber mallet? IKEA customers can very literally build an entire home's worth of furniture on a very tight budget. What we have not done 
is partnered with somebody who has that expertise within that IKEA formula yeah. to bring them to Trinidad and to teach our people to produce the furniture, yeah. to package it, and get the export TT company to do some work now. They Go and find the market so the people so we can earn for an exchange they, from it. They can't figure that on their own. Our people are producing good, good furniture in this country, excellent furniture. Mm -hmm. But we need now to package it in a way that can be sold on the export market. And when you package it, you have more can fit into a container, you can export more, and you can build a whole industry. And Trinidad can become known because Trinidad and Tobago has still has one of the largest reserves of natural teak in the world. In the world. Absolutely. Madam Speaker, <laughs> cocoa. Cocoa. We boast of our cocoa. But it seems that little is being done to ensure that cocoa grown on our shores is sold to as many markets as possible. In my constituency, there's a cocoa fermentry that is managed by a gentleman whose name is Harriman Chattagoon. Mr. Chattagoon is an, has become a buying agent for cocoa and coffee. Now, I visited Mr. Chattagoon uh, at his fermentry recently and saw that at least 50 tons of cocoa is being stored. This may be because he's a small fermentary and has no support to access to larger markets. But farmers are reporting that while the company is finding them some markets for the cocoa, they are often much smaller and much less profitable than markets they find out on their own. Where is the backing for these farmers? Where is the backing for these farmers? They are saying that they're being passed over for larger, more reputable, as they call them, cocoa cooperatives. Why is the cocoa development company failing to find these small farmers profitable markets? Where is the marketing help? Madam Speaker, we are paying all kinds of so-called marketing experts in all these comp state companies we set up, but are they a failure? They're not doing what they're supposed to do to market the produce of this country Correct. overseas. Correct. I'm sorry, but they could be what professionals, but they are failed us. Yeah. They're not finding the market. And if you want to review, review some of those professionals and see where the lack of productivity also is in terms of, 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 of their performance. Madam Speaker, we go on chewing. We if we have we the best grade of cocoa <laughs> in Trinidad and Tobago, why can't we find a foreign chocolatier to invest right here in Trinidad and Tobago? You go into Grand Coover in my constituency, several chocolatiers have developed, and they're making um, dark chocolate in particular. What prevents us? from getting somebody to come and partner here with us so we could develop a really viable chocolate industry rather than go to Belgium and see on the shelf of it made with Trinidad and Tobago cocoa. Yes, on the, on, on the box, made with Trinidad and Tobago cocoa. They are trading, they are getting all the value added, but we are not getting the value added here. The bee industry, the honey industry is suffering. You know why? Because, Madam Speaker, the, bee, the, 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 the honey is being imported undercover, and people who are not using their April licenses numbers are then taking that honey and allowing it, allowing unscrupulous people to bottle it under their April numbers. <laughs> and therefore, they are affecting the honey industry. Madam Speaker, we have spoken a lot about tourism. But, uh, you know, I want to give you an example of how tourism can be developed in this country. There's a young man in my constituency by the name of Trinel Ghani. And he started a mountain bike trail in Grand Coover. You can visit and see this, this trail. That is bordering my constituency and that of Dr. Tiwari. He also is a young technician, but he also runs the Gordon Village Activity Center, which we built. After 45 years when the community said there was burnt down, nobody built a center for them. We built that activity center. And he is the, the director of the Grand Coover Community Development Group, as well as Ghani's Cocoa Estate. Now, what is interesting is that Kuva is becoming the sporting capital of the Caribbean thanks to what we did there with all that we did. Thanks to the progressive vision of Anil Roberts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, group, yeah. his group, Madam Speaker, his group has applied for state land under their NGO so that they can move more non-motorized sports. Example, yoga, jogging, bird watching, hiking. It can be used by, for scouting groups, for camping, etc. And nobody is listening to them. Mr. Franklin Khan, as a minister, when he heard about this person, where he had gone to present at a local government concert, he said, come and see me. Well, four years have gone, and nothing has happened to that vision of this young person. Yes. Yes. Madam Speaker, 
So you don't want to give the NGO the land? Give it to the Kuva Tabakit Regional Corporation and let them go into a, a new relationship. You're talking about local government reform? Well, if you want local government reform, you have to expand the thing. Yes. The regional corporations will have a responsibility for developing local tourism sites, but this local tourism site can become an international site. Madam Speaker, there's a lot I would like to say, but I think I've made my point about how this country can be diversified. Yes. I've made my point that what we have in the United National Congress is an alternative or development agenda for opportunities beyond hope. Hope is one thing, but hope must be translated into opportunities. I've talked about the need to develop an entrepreneurial class because not everybody could get a, a job in the state sector or in a private company. And we have the industrious people in this country willing to do it. We have the young people with ambition. We have the young people with the talent. We have the young people with the training. Let us not by our, uh, our, our self-interest frustrate them. Madam Speaker, let us move away from the vitriolic language that took place in this parliament after the opposition leader spoke. And let me look at something that is more uplifting, more spiritually enhancing, more. and more beautiful for the nation that is Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you. Okay, um, honorable members, I think now is a good time for us to take the suspension. We'll be back at 6.35.